be. CSIS has been working on the issue of middle income countries, uh, has also been working on the issue of partnerships and networks of partnerships, and have also looked at the issue of supply chains and value chains um, in, a, in a number of different contexts. We did a report about a year ago for the, uh, for the U.S. government on strategic foreign assistance transitions, uh, which I'm happy to give copies of folks to offline, or you can get it on, on the web. Uh, we also did a report, uh, my friend and colleague Holly Wise is here looking at public-private partnerships. Many of the public-private partnerships that we'll be talking about later um, are, del are in networks or networks of networks. How do you manage them? How do you lead them? How do you share knowledge? These are, this is a critical uh, question uh, for specialists. And then also the issue of the power of supply chains and value chains. Unido, who's our partner and sponsor of this conference, um, spends a lot of time in its work as a UN agency thinking about how to work with value chains and support value chains and support industrial development um, that's, that also supports broader development at large. Uh, I want to thank my friend Steve Holloway, who's here. Uh, Steve is the representative for UNIDO here in Washington. He's a, a friend and colleague and wanted to thank him for making this all happen. Thank you, Steve, for your support. Um, we have a very distinguished guest speaker today uh, who will be joining us both for our live audience as well as our online audience. We have the Foreign Minister of Costa Rica, Enrique Castillo, who's going to be joining, who's going to be joining me here at the podium in a second. Um, Enrique Castillo has a very di distinguished career. Uh, he was trained as a sociologist. Uh, he's also uh, uh, someone who has served as an ambassador in a number of uh, countries. Um, he's also involved in, in public life and he currently serves as the, the foreign minister of, of Costa Rica. Costa Rica will be hosting a very important conference on financing for development next month um, and we see this conference as sort of the pregame uh, to that conference in a way to sort of socialize the ideas that will be coming out of this conference and so without further ado I'm going to cede the floor to uh, the minister Enrique Castillo. Thank you very much minister. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you Mr. Rand, for your welcome uh, to me uh, in this place. Uh, it is a privilege, uh, distinct privilege to be here with you today. Good morning, everybody. And uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to address you today here in Washington, D.C. at this important workshop on network governance and the development potential of middle-income countries. The topic of today's meeting resides at the core of Costa Rica's future development and international development cooperation strategy. Thanks to policies and actions we in Costa Rica implemented over almost three decades now, and in turn as a result of a long history of investing in economic and social development, we'll feel that Costa Rica has positioned itself particularly well to take advantage of today's globalized economy. I therefore hope you will find our perspective as a fully fleshed middle income country of interest for today's talks. Allow me to provide some historical background to today's situation. Over the past 20 years, many middle income countries have achieved a phenomenal growth and development, bringing prosperity to millions of people, building democratic societies, fostering innovation and knowledge and increasingly becoming key drivers of world economic development in this current era of globalization. Looking back at the past decades, I believe that the most distinctive factor of global development in determining the pathway of middle-income countries are the various phases of post-colonial globalization based on a voluntary process of increasingly integrating global norms and systems. Let me be a little bit more specific. During the first decades after World War II, 
Many middle income countries went through the hard struggles of nation building and traditional international relations with an ever increasing number of states, mostly in America, parts of Asia, and new island states in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Latin America in general, and Costa Rica in particular, had achieved independence earlier and were struggling with changes of a different nature during the past, the post-war period. The United Nations, built to export the ideals of democracy, self-determination, free enterprise, and human rights, was created during this period, but also shaped it. Let me call this stage Globalization I. Of course, we know that Globalization I was the, the, where the century, 15th and 16th centuries where uh, discovery and conquest uh, occurred. But in modern times, this would be the first period, the time of the, 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 the appearance of the United Nations. The next phase was characterized by increasing international trade in industrial goods, primarily among richer nations, but with raw materials delivered by a growing number of developing countries. This was certainly a first push towards economic globalization, but the effect on developing countries was at times, at times precarious. As market doctrine was globalized, it pushed some developing countries that had some degree of protected industrialization of the development ladder. This is the time of GATT, trade fights and first vast financial crisis in Latin America and Asia. Nevertheless, countries like South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and Israel were early success stories during this period. The larger countries in Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina especially, started to develop an industrial base, but mostly geared to domestic or regional markets. Let me call this period globalization too. Today, in the post-financial crisis world, I believe that we have entered a new stage of global development and international order. Let me call this globalization three, number three, or the stage of a global village, the core element of which I will elaborate next. Economic globalization. The world has continued to grow into an almost single global marketplace with an increasing number of transnational corporations that emerge both from traditional industrialized countries like the US, as well as increasingly from emerging markets such as China, India, Brazil, or in fact, also Costa Rica. Different modalities of trade agreements are negotiated to overcome them, although globally speaking, this is not just the optimum path. At the same time, even small and medium-sized companies from emerging economies have entered the global markets, unthinkable in the past, and are becoming a real backbone to the global economy, stabilizing markets when large industrialized nations struggle. Economic globalization three is more complex, interdependent, and mutually vulnerable than ever in history. Let me be clear. These markets, whether national, regional, or global, are competitive but not free in the classic definition. But they do offer a multitude of opportunities to different sized players. Technological globalization. Closely linked to this trend in economic globalization, technology has globalized at an ever rapid speed benefiting millions of people in developing countries to access not only information through internet and other information and communication technologies, innovations, who has not seen their kids or grandchildren benefit from this, but also improved solutions for common developmental problems such as water purification, immunization of, or public mass transport. Cleaner production and more sustainable ways of consumption are enabled through technological innovation and related knowledge as well as its global application. It is no wonder that this year, 
the UN Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, will focus its annual ministerial debate on this particular issue, which is also closely linked to the effectiveness and sustainability of any, develop in, in, of any development effort. There are certainly many unfulfilled needs in developing countries, both LDCs and MICs, with respect to technology transfer, adaptation, and indigenous generation. Globalization 3 is certainly characterized by technological globalization. Political globalization. The world is also becoming more complex and multipolar in its political governance structures, with a larger number of middle-income countries playing an increasingly active role in shaping the international development paths and paradigms. This will be very much at the center of our discussions today. The most influential countries comprise those with higher degrees of relative development and an enhanced ability to link themselves into the global markets and knowledge networks. This is certainly most visible with the relatively recent emergence of the G20 as a key global governance mechanism, but also in aspects of the Busan Partnership for Development Effectiveness, modest adjustments in the governance structures of the international financial institutions, and other similar attempts at redefining the prevailing governance architecture of international affairs. At the same time, Global governance has become more complex as non-state actors are becoming involved in governance networks, including the aforementioned business sector, as well as non-governmental organizations and academic institutions. As this, and this happens at local, regional, and global levels. Political globalization three is more complex interdependent and mutually vulnerable than ever in history. Costa Rica, a country with no global power ambitions, observes these phenomena with interest and strives to influence, however modestly, this reshaping, especially because as a country without an army, we depend on the legal multilateral governance system for our own security. Environmental globalization. I will not do too much on the globalized conscience as regards the protection of the environment. We saw the global engagement of thousands of interested groups, institutions, and of course, governments at the Rio Plus 20 Sustainability Summit last year in Brazil. It is clearly recognized that climate change, air, water, soil pollution, and other human-borne environmental footprints have an impact beyond national borders. In fact, the ramifications of inadequate attention to environmental issues are already triggering consequences that are truly global in scale. The complexity of our impact on the environment has no precedent in human history. It is also, I believe, a key part of globalization three in the sense that today's global environmental challenges, above all climate change, are clearly among the most serious challenges for humanity as a whole, together with the eradication of hunger and poverty worldwide. These three concerns are also intrinsically related as are the solutions to each, but the way in which different countries address or fail to address environmental issues will increasingly benefit or disadvantage all countries as we witness an inevitable intensification of environmental globalization as these issues further come to a head. Cultural globalization. In view of the incredible process of integration at other levels, some wonder if the world is not drifting apart on a cult cultural divide. Even here, I believe that we have entered a new era of globalization with a genuine appreciation for the other. Like in any, familiar, in, like in any family, there are differences of, of opinion. 
It is possible the, the most sensitive and complex field of our current stage of global development. But I believe that cultural globalization is not about the assimilation of our cultures, but about the appreciation of our cultures. Global tourism and an increasing number of intercultural programs and activities have created a generation that is inspired by the cultural diversity and intercultural exchange and respect. I cannot think of any period in history when such cultural globalization free ever happened. This is an encouraging development. However, in order to avoid misunderstandings, and given that this road is not without some risky bumps, I should also state my belief that a limiting factor to cultural relativism is the full respect of the values, principles, and commitments contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Much progress still needs to be made in realizing inalienable human rights for all people, and there is notable variation in the level of success in doing so across regional and national levels. But the global trend for fostering respect and dignity for people everywhere moves in a clear and positive direction that should continue to be bolstered. bolstered. Globalization three has many other facets, but I believe the five mentioned, the economic, technological, political, environmental, and cultural are the most pronounced and relevant for middle income countries. This new era of globalization requires us to rethink global governance. New funds, new funds forms of uh, globalization should permit new found solutions to today's most serious issues. As we enter uncharted waters, we should promote bold in thinking to escape all traps as we seek to improve and sustain the prosperity for all. The United Nations remains the most legitimate pillar of global governance, but we need to reform the United Nations system to fit the requirements of a new era of globalization three. In particular, because of the changing needs of middle-income countries and emerging economies, we need a new and open dialogue on the future of our international system and on what we can possibly expect from globalization for, for the next generations. The dramatic growth of the past decades experienced, especially by middle-income countries, has also led to a serious expansion of income inequality. An equal access to assets and resources, including knowledge, globally but especially in the developing world, remain persistent challenges. Indeed, high levels of inequality are detrimental to the social fabric of countries, impede economic growth or shorten periods of growth, and undermine progress toward achieving a set of development goals. It goes without saying that persistent inequalities are unjust in themselves and harmful to future generations. So, middle-income countries have a hugely important role to play in the development agenda as living examples of how to pull away from poverty, but also because MICs still house to over half of all poverty. In the new geog geography of poverty, 65% of the world's poor live in middle-income countries. Any poverty reduction policy worthy of its name has to take this new reality into account. It is also a fact that international development cooperation is not a zero-sum game. The achievements and examples of MICs will continue to lead to significant benefits for the world. These will accrue across the pillars of globalization, economic, technological, cultural, etc. Also, new markets and a growing global middle class also presents challenges and dangers, particularly in environmental and equality terms. This is why it is so important for the international community to work actively across the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental. 
We cannot achieve a balanced and integrated approach of the three dimensions of sustainable development by proceeding on the basis of business as usual. Current production and consumption patterns are unsustainable. At the same time, there can be huge economic gains from increasing resource efficiency in production. In order to decouple economic growth from the consumption of natural resources, energy and materials, we also need a significant change in our mindsets. At the same time, international development cooperation itself has to change. It has to appreciate a new era of networked development in which multiple actors are able to leverage development outcomes through knowledge and other assets. These actors include a growing diversity and breadth of participants beyond just governments and international organizations, with the private sector, civil society, academia and foundations taking on greater importance with each passing decade. UNIDO research conducted as part of the organization's Networks for Prosperity initiative provides compelling policy relevant elements relevant evidence that in today's world there is a strong correlation between a country's international connectedness and its economic and environmental performance. The structure of aid also may be reviewed. Rather than development agencies or traditional donor countries directly carrying out programs in developing countries, it might be more effective to explore partnerships involving middle-income countries. One example could be through expander, expanded triangular cooperation initiatives, such as developed countries supporting middle-income countries to assist lower-income countries on a regional basis. It certainly was the experience of Costa Rica that change has been promoted and incentivized through a range of processes spanning public and private partnerships for business as well as north-south south-south and triangular cooperation and improvements in political governance. Let me be clear, however, there are lessons to be learned but not general recopies for development. Every country will have its own recipe for success, although regional formulas may be more suitable than examples for other parts of the world or models transposed from high-income countries. The issue of connectedness needs to be at the center of the post-2015 development agenda because it is by taking best advantage of our newly networked world that we will find the most efficient, effective and innovative way forward. For connectivity to be taken full advantage, advantage of, we must go beyond mere access. In a world in which knowledge has been democratized to unprecedented levels, the international development community has to appreciate that, that effective networking alone does not equal action. That is, the ability to integrate, master new knowledge and act for it, and act on it. That is, the ability to integrate, master, I repeat, master new knowledge and act on it. For the later to happen, MICs and other developing countries need to specially build up their absorptive capacities for knowledge. This implies, above all, enormous efforts in education starting from the very earliest age through at least to the end of secondary or vocational education. Knowledge networking is recognized as one of the new and most dynamic instruments for middle-income countries in meeting the challenges of private sector development and related sustainability challenges. Although it is critical that knowledge networking is shared and spread among different social sectors, further, network, further work needs to be done, as UNIDO also recognizes, to fully oper operationalize network governance. In this context, UNIDO's Networks for Prosperity Initiative and Green Industrial Platform can provide the foundation for a new innovative industrial policy built on the network approach. 
the experiences of Costa Rica with creating effective knowledge networks, particularly at the regional level, level were presented as a valuable example for other countries to learn from. The challenge ahead is to continue to translate the conceptual insights and achievements to date into concrete action on the ground, while taking into account the different realities individual countries face. Let me conclude my remarks today by turning briefly to some of the issues of the current UN agenda on development as they are essential for middle-income countries and relate closely also to issues of network governance. The debate on the set of developmental global uh, of, of development goals that will replace the current Millennium Development Goals, M MDGs, after 2015, is becoming increasingly intense with frequent consultations, high-level meetings and discussions being held around the world. It would, be, it would go beyond the time allotted to me to recount this in detail. Suffice to say that there are currently two main tracks. The first one consists of UN-led national consultations, currently 66, 11 thematic consultations on topics that might be subject of new goals, a high-level panel of eminent persons appointed by the Secretary General that will report very shortly, and a number of other interagency UN activities. The second is an open working group of 30 member states established by the Rio Plus 20 outcome document, which has been charged with elaborating a set of sustainable development goals. Eventually, these streams will come together in an intergovernmental process, and the new goals will ultimately be adopted by the General Assembly. It is worth noting that financial considerations are becoming an increasingly important part of these discussions, and are, li are, are likely to stay high on the agenda. In that sense, there is a strong contrast with how the financing was dealt with in the run-up to the MDGs, which is to say, not at all. The Millennium, De the Millennium Development Go Goals have been able to operationalize a common global development agenda. However, the MDGs are silent about the, their means of implementation including financing and how to achieve the results proposed by this development framework. Looking ahead, I can see that the United Nations development system is already thinking of how to tackle implementation issues, including financing, financing in a way that connects, connects it with the formal intergovernmental process. It is quite likely that after the high-level event on NDGs at the UNGA this September, we will see a new round of consultations that addresses, among other things, financing. We may also see the emergence of some specific tracks emphasizing the role and needs of middle-income countries in that regard. We should, we should all approach these challenges with an open mind and with a generous and long-term perspective. That is why we feel, as far as the future of development financing and the kickoff for the structures for globalization three is concerned, the high-level conference on middle-income countries in San Jose in June 2013 will be of great importance. This will be, as far as I can see, the only real opportunity for middle-income countries as a group to take the initiative on issues like financing, as well as the evolving role of middle-income countries as partners in development before the final round of formal UN discussions on these issues gets underway. I am sure that at San Jose, participants will rise to the occasion. Now that you have heard a Costa Rican perspective, I will be particularly interested to hear your thoughts on the emerging role of middle-income countries in this networked world of ours. I look forward to take these viewpoints back with me to San Jose as substantive inputs for our high-level MIC's conference this June. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, oh. Minister. Thank you, you so will. much. You're going to take. You'll take a couple questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Steve Holloway back there. If you could, Ray, Rachel, if you'd get to my friend Steve, if you would. Thank you very much. Steve Holloway, uh, formerly of UNIDO, now at the World Bank. Uh, Minister, first of all, uh, I would hope that uh, your remarks would be circulated among the missions in New York. And frankly, uh, you could give that speech to the opening session of the GA in September, just as you said it. They, they certainly could use hearing those words uh, from your country. Um, which leads me to my, to, to my question. Why, what has led you to take a leadership role in this whole area, hosting the conference, um, speaking so eloquently on it, but what, what, what led you and the government of Costa Rica to take this on as a, as a, in a leadership capacity? Uh, of course, thank you very much uh, for your remarks. Uh, well, for Costa Rica, this is a matter that uh, is of big concern because we have been making improvements since at least the 1940s, where we established a, a, a social, uh, social care system uh, very advanced, but at the same time we started the economic development and growth. And since then, since the, at least this, the, the end of the, eight, the 40s, we've, we have been growing up at a, uh, at, a, at a rate as a, a como termino medio, como mediana? As an average, thank you, as an average in, in 60 years at a rate of 4% a year. Sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but the average is 4% 4, 4 of growth every year during 60 years. But also increasing the social protection of our human resources. And that has allowed us to, to arrive to this point of, being, of becoming a middle-income country. But now that we, but, and we did that with with the help of international cooperation. Of course, we put in place our own efforts, but we have received cooperation from abroad, be it uh, country friends or international organizations. Now we achieve this level. It is said to us, okay, that's enough. You are big enough to, to, to play by on your own, and goodbye. And we feel that it's unfair because we've done the homework very well, and now we are released. And there are challenges that middle-income countries, middle countries as Costa Rica cannot face on their own. We, need, we still need the international cooperation. This process of growing up has uh, br brought in uh, inequality bigger than before, and we cannot face it alone because it requires uh, efforts that are, go further than our own capacity. And so we, we are uh, looking around, being placed in that situation, and that's wh wh why we felt the necessity to call a meeting for countries like us. But in the company of developed countries, which are also being invited, to discuss, not in order to try to get the same kind of cooperation that we before received, but looking for new partnerships that allow us to keep growing, but also to help the world keep growing. We don't ask for donations anymore. We don't ask for not, not reimbursable help. We look for partnerships and ways of development, developing in order to increase our wealth, but also the world's wealth. 
So that is that is the reason for which uh, we 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 made this this uh, we are organizing in collaboration with UNUDI with UNITO uh, this big conference, and we hoped that new paths be discovered in it. I just I'll take advantage, uh, Minister, of your comments about Costa Rica's assistance in our report. We talk about the U.S. engagement in Costa Rica, the history of U.S. engagement. As you know, the United States left as a development partner to Costa Rica in the mid-90s after having helped establish INCAI, the mm -hmm. very prominent business school in Costa Rica, as well as uh, Fundex, which is an export, was an export organization uh, as well. So the U.S. was very proud to be a, a, a development partner, and obviously the trade relationship is so, so large now with mm -hmm. the United States, and uh, Costa Rica is, uh, is a great trade and cooperation partner for the United States, and of course the, what was what was left behind, perhaps in not the most strategic way on the part of the United States, was the Co Costa Rica-U.S. friendship as a CRUSA, the mm -hmm. Friendship Association and yes. uh, Endowed Foundation. Uh, so I know there's there have been various attempts to to think about how donors think about how they transition from being a do having a donor relationship to something akin to a trade and cooperation relationship. And we've looked at this issue and. I think you've eloquently described that we want to have. It's important to have ongoing connectivity and to take advantage of the lessons learned that um, that countries like Costa Rica have to offer to the world. And of, of course, do you expound it in your remarks as well? Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Costa Rica is, is a good example of that. And, and the recent visit that uh, President Obama uh, made to Costa Rica some days ago uh, was also in that in that direction. Uh, he came to Costa Rica not to bring mil a, a bag of uh, full of money, but to propose to propose uh, projects that would enable both countries to take advantage of it. For instance, we we need to develop clean energies. Uh, we we are using well, most of our energy it comes comes from 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 clean uh, uh, sources, but still we have to 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 accomplish. Um, a, at least 15 percent more uh, of, of clean energy because there, we, we have 15 percent that is not uh, satisfied by, by clean energy uh, but by, by fuel, for instance, yeah. that is expensive and, and uh, uh, contaminating. So we talked about that and we, we, uh, we reached a sort of agreement. Uh, we, we need natural gas or hydrogen and but which we don't produce but we need them and we can get them from the United States at lower prices than the international markets uh, thanks to our trade free trade agreements so these will open at the same time opportunities for US companies to invest in Costa Rica and to make profits so this is a win-win partnership. That is the kind of cooperation that we need. We need perhaps the raw materials, but most uh, most important about about that above that is, is the technology and the knowledge. So that is a way of helping in a, in an effective way these kind of countries like like uh, middle-income countries. You you have time for one more question. Yeah, I would take okay, one, one okay. more. But Barbara. Thank you. Um, uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much. I would like to also echo the words of uh, my colleague Steve about the highly insightful presentation, which was much appreciated. Uh, my name is Barbara Kreisler. I'm from UNIDO. And my question would be how uh, you talked in your speech about the end now of the Millennium Development Goals and the move to the Sustainable Development Goals. From a middle-income country perspective, what would you like the Sustainable Development Goals to, to focus on, particularly focusing now on the context of a middle-income country such as Costa Rica? Thank you very much for your question. Well, uh, 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 I, we think that uh, the 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 goals the goals of the millennium are in fact opportunities because they show the country uh, the way uh, we should follow. 
So these are objectives that help us to, to, to go on the good track. And we are only uh, concerned at this moment. We have accomplished most of them, uh, but we know there are other countries uh, that hasn't do that uh, or haven't been able to do it. But we, 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 we are in a very good position. And nevertheless, we, we are already thinking about the next, the post-2015 uh, goals. And we think that we should plan it plan it very well from now because we don't we don't want to arrive at 12th 2015 and and uh, find a gap or a a bridge between the first plan and the second plan so we would like to have a smooth transition uh, from the first goals to the, to the goals after 2015. So that's, that is our current concern. And we view that as the way to, 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 for prosperity. It, we, since many years ago, we, we, we abandoned the concept of economic growth equal uh, development. For us, development should be something integral with, with, uh, um, um, uh, uh, policies that integrate minorities and and, uh, and of, of any kind, ethnic mi minorities, youth and women, etc., etc., and to develop in that way the human resources we need for 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 achieving prosperity. So we need uh, clean water, clean energies, labor, good labor practices, as well as investment. And I think we can reach all that with the uh, Millennium Goals. Thank you. One, one more? Sure. Uh, B Bill Reese. Hey, Rachel. Your Excellency, let me just give one more example of how our two countries work together and left a lasting legacy, not just the binational relations, but regional and global cooperation. It's the founding of Earth yes. University. That your government and our government, USAID, mm -hmm. the Kellogg Foundation, multinational businesses, and, and Costa Rican mm -hmm. businesses created mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. That university is drawing students from all over Latin America mm -hmm. and now from Africa. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the university is mentoring new African universities, not just to build the physical structure, but to, to bring in a new, more hands on oriented, uh, business oriented, entrepreneurship oriented uh, ag. Uh, university to, to other parts of the developing world, and I think that's a legacy of, of the way our two countries can work together, again, broader than just our binational interests, but on global issues. Thank you very much. You are, you are right. Uh, that is also a good example. Let, let me just uh, close just with a couple comments, uh, Minister. Thank you so much for being here. I just want to you to take back with you to Costa Rica just a couple thoughts as well from CSIS. I think one is is that we think that the 10-year bull market on official development assistance is over, that the 10-year, we've hit the 10-year high of official foreign aid from OECD countries. So I think finding additional resources to, to, and as you've said in your speech, it's a different kind of a paradigm to engage with middle-income countries. But I think it's going to be, yes, there are many of the world's poor are in middle-income countries, but I think it's going to be very hard to justify to publics in the United States or in Europe, for example, in the UK, traditional foreign assistance sorts of paradigms to countries, I'll use the country of India because it's a little bit more extreme, but if a country has a space exploration program like India, and while at the same time still has a tuberculosis program, it's going to be very difficult for the American public to, to subsidize India's space exploration program by paying for their tuberculosis. Now, if you told me from a geostrategic standpoint for the United States that we were going to get a uh, and a military base for some other reason, or there was some other geostrategic reason for the U.S. to do it, that might be that might be justified. But I think in this era, where you're going to see official development assistance go from about 120 billion dollars a year to something like 100 billion or 90, I think the path of least political resistance is going to be middle-income countries. So I think, as middle-income countries think about triangular cooperation, developing agencies to do this sorts of work, identifying ways to have cooperation, having capabilities to do that, having those counterpart capabilities are going to be sought more and more because it's going to be very difficult to sell, whether it's the UK or the United States or otherwise, to say, look, if somebody's got uh, X or Y, the Sovereign Wealth Fund or a Space Exploration Program, 
et cetera, et cetera, that these things are going to be very hard to sell. So I, I wanted just you to take that back, as, and we'll be, we'll be joining you in, in June in Costa Rica, but I think, think for governments in middle-income countries to have the capabilities to, pro, to be a good counterpart partner is going to be something that's going to be required over the next 10 years as well. So I want to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and that's very pertinent because uh, th we are very aware of, of it. And that's why uh, w we are allowing a big space for the private sector. Uh, it, is, it is with the private sector we, that we can uh, materialize uh, many of our needs and projects. Uh, the last example, uh, again with the visit of President Obama, it was proposed to President Obama, or at least he was informed about that. Uh, we have a private company uh, headed by a, a Costa Rican astronaut uh, from NASA. He's retired already. He, he created a company, and he's developing a, a new engine uh, with a low-cost energy. And he is... Uh, um, he made already a merger or an agreement uh, a, um, a, with Cummings, the producers of engines. So both private corporations are working together. So that is a, a good way in which we can engage the private sector in our development. And it's absolutely natural that they do that. So uh, we, 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 can, we, we must see it in that, in that perspective. That is why this conference that we are approaching in June, it's very good that it's being hosted also by UNIDO. Exactly. Industrial development, that means something. But of course there is also agriculture and other areas. Thank you. Minister, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking the minister. I'm going to ask the panelists from the first panel to join me, if you would. Kazuki, uh, Jan Voters, uh, Tim Meyer, and friend Jerry O'Brien. Great. Good. We're going to get started uh, right away. Thank you all uh, for uh, being with us today. I'm. Uh, this panel is going to be talking about the future of international cooperation and growing prosperity through knowledge partnerships. Uh, and really, this, this panel and this work it, were instigated by a very interesting and thought-provoking report that UNIDO sponsored, and, um, and we participated in the launch of that report in Vienna in December, and there are copies of it outside, about networks for prosperity. I'm going to ask uh, Kazuki Kitaoka, the manager of Networks for Prosperity Initiative at UNIDO, to help us frame up this discussion and to speak first. So uh, you have his biography in front of you, and I'll introduce each of the, the speakers in turn. But Kazuki, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Dan. And um, uh, first of all, uh, I would also like to um, thank our, our partners from um, uh, Costa Rica to be here in, in such a big um, uh, number. It's, uh, it's a great collaboration that we have in this, in this uh, 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 project that we have um, put together about two and a half years ago called Networks for Prosperity. And um, I would like to give you first, before going to the, um, uh, to the report itself, uh, into the, the background of um, why we, as uh, a UN agency that is dealing with industrial development, um, has come up with um, with this particular initiative and why and how we are um, uh, seeing the way forward for um, after this um, report has been um, uh, launched um, uh, at different places and um, after um, the uh, the forthcoming conference in, in Costa Rica. The, the initiative was um, conceived about three years ago um, together with the government of Spain and um, 12 uh, interested middle-income countries that um, saw that the, exactly as um, was mentioned before, the future of uh, ODA, the future of um, uh, development assistance is changing very rapidly. Um, we saw that uh, uh, globalization, as the foreign minister has um, elaborated so um, eloquently, uh, has uh, uh, entered a new stage. Um, with it, the, uh, the, the, the concept of industrialization, the concept of global industrialization has also um, entered a new stage. 
Um, some of this ha had to do with um, uh, the large financial crisis we've, we faced in, in 2008. Some of it was uh, a simple, um, uh, probably uh, almost linear um, trend that we have seen over the last 20 years in, um, in, in globalizing value chains. I understand the second panel is going to talk about that. Uh, particular issue and the, the role of the, uh, the private sector in, um, in globalization, the role of the private sector also in, um, in global governance um, uh, in, in, um, in, in a more in-depth um, manner. And for us in, um, in the UN, one of the questions was if the, the private sector is going to be much more of a, a global player in governance, if, the, if industry is uh, to play um, an uh, a more decisive role in um, in 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 deciding what um, development and development assistance are going to look like. What is the role of the UN um, and more precisely also of uh, UNIDO as the development uh, industrial development agency um, in uh, in in this new landscape? And that was really very much the background um, uh, from which we came um, when we started to uh, to work on this um, networks of prosperity. Uh, initiative. At the same time, as also the, the, the foreign minister um, very clearly said, the, um, the issue today is not necessarily money. Um, the issue today is, in most cases, technology and knowledge. So the question here was, how can, particularly in middle-income countries where money is not the, the, the primary issue, we as a, as a UN agency, but also with all the partners that we work um, together um, around the globe, uh, help connecting those uh, knowledge nodes, knowledge poles, um, to improve the, uh, the, the uh, development possibilities and abilities of uh, developing countries in, um, in a more substantive and um, uh, sustainable manner. And here, um, again, middle-income countries are really at the core of, uh, of our attention, also considering that um, out of the almost 200 um, uh, member states of the UN, 110, so more than 50%, are actually middle-income countries, mm -hmm. which um, uh, uh, is uh, interesting. We have been talking about the Millennium Development Goals, um, which have been broadly uh, focusing on, on the least developed, 49 least developed countries of the um, uh, of our membership, which is actually a, a, a relatively small minority. And the question uh, will be, I think, also in the future um, development uh, uh, agenda that we are now elaborating at, uh, as we speak, uh, what we are going to do for those 110, more than um, half of our membership um, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, development. But let me come back to the, um, to, to the, to the background of this, of this report. Um, what we think is networks will play a key role in managing globalization in the future. Networks will um, not only be um, government networks, they will be multi-stakeholder, they will include um, the universities, the private sector and others, industry particularly. They will um, uh, not have one center, they will have multi-centers, etc. All of these findings we have tried to at least touch upon in this report that we have um, issued, um, which is actually the second report. We had a first report about two years ago. This is the second report. And what we believe is that um, we are moving really into the direction of an ecosystem of development actors, of knowledge actors, which help each other um, in, uh, uh, in this new phase of globalization um, to uh, uh, to form what development assistance is going to look like in the um, in the future, um, that that is our perspective for that. Now, coming to the report, um, it has essentially three parts. The first part is looking into these slightly more broad um, post 2015, as we as we have been talking about. This is essentially a, a UN terminology for. Um, what is going to happen after the Mellon Development Goals that are at the moment the, the primary agenda for, um, for the UN and um, I think also broadly for the World Bank um, uh, have been expired in 2015. Um, what we think is that the, the, the agenda will have to be broader. Um, some of this is um, in, in the first chapter of this report. Um, what we also think is that here uh, we need to um, take into the consideration um, uh, large emerging economies, um, we, we have been talking Brazil, um, uh, uh, South Africa, China, um, uh, India and others. Um, their role will be very different uh, 
as we see it in this um, in this new um, uh, uh, era of um, of development. The second part uh, of the report is looking into um, what the foreign minister has also been um, mentioning: the connectedness. Um, uh, we are trying to um, uh, quantify connectedness between countries, and um, here I'm very glad to. Um, uh, that we had a, a brilliant partnership with um, the uh, uh, um, University of Leuven and, um, and other um, uh, academic partners that could bring together um, a, an index uh, for um, 140 countries um, uh, indexing their connectedness, their ability to um, connect knowledge across borders but also within their country. And um, as such, what we think is this index shows their ability to manage um, their way in this era of globalization where knowledge is really the, the, the core issue, the core um, uh, commodity, if you want, that, that is necessary for their development. Um, and then a third part is uh, looking into uh, a, a number of examples, um, a number of case studies um, Tim is going to uh, uh, mention one of them, and uh, we end with um, recommendations on uh, the uh, kind of network development that we think uh, should be uh, the, the cornerstone of the, um, of the future uh, development agenda. Now, um, I finish with this, and I see that uh, there is already the next um, presentation here on the screen. Um, uh, let me f uh, finish probably with um, Two, uh, 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 two issues. One is, why um, did we uh, combine this particular activity with um, the, uh, the report that came from the CSIS on um, transition assistance? We believe that this um, report on transition assistance is very interesting from, from the point of view of a traditional donor country. We are looking at, this, at the same issue, essentially, from the, um, from the UN and, um, and middle-income country perspective. I think bringing those two perspectives together will probably be um, the, uh, the most interesting way of, of really forming the future um, development agenda and also assistance agenda that, um, that we are trying to uh, uh, create uh, for the future. Um, and also this will possibly answer some of the questions on who and how are we going to finance all of this that we want to uh, uh, create in, um, uh, in this new era. Um, and finally, let me thank um, again the, the government of Costa Rica. Um, I'm looking forward to this uh, conference that we have um, in June. I think the three topics that we have chosen are wisely chosen, um, uh, looking into growth, looking into sustainability, and then the financing of it. And um, yes, I hope uh, I see all of you there um, for a great new discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kazuki. Uh, Mr. Vowder, Dr. Vowders, if you would, uh, please uh, come to the, to the podium and, and speak from the dais. Uh, the, you were one of the co-authors of this report, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be here in Washington, D.C. In the face of evolving global challenges and shifting notions and constellations of development, the strategies which are being developed to achieve economic growth and stability are changing as well. Networks, and in particular networks of knowledge, are becoming increasingly important in order to support development which adheres to the MDGs and their post-2015 successors. This is the starting point. This is the basic premise of the Networks for Prosperity initiative, which uh, UNIDO, together with our Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, is jointly developing. This initiative aims to expand the understanding of how networks function in theory, but also in practice. Doing so exposes the ways in which networks can disseminate information capable of influencing development practices. Research centers on UNIDO's recognition of networks as major contributors to development, and it builds on the fast 
growing body of academic research in many disciplines, which recognizes the importance of network governance as a distinct form of governance. Bearing this in mind, the Networks for Prosperity initiative acknowledges networks as this emerging governance structure, but also builds on the notion of sustained cooperation between actors and states. And I'll explain that in a moment, because the importance of building on sustained cooperation is also highlighted um, in the high-level panel of eminent persons, which was mentioned already by the foreign minister. This high-level panel, following their recent meeting in March in Bali, identified four key areas on which progress is needed to achieve their post-2015 vision. And one of those four key areas Yes, and I quote, is to reshape and revitalize global governance and partnerships. They note that in order to achieve prosperity for all, I quote again, enhanced and scaled up models of cooperation among all levels of government, the private sector and civil society at the global, regional, national and subnational levels will be needed. Now, one of the key challenges for states, and especially middle-income countries, is how to reap the benefits from sustained cooperation in a world which is characterized by a strong increase, even a proliferation, of formal and informal bilateral, plurilateral, multilateral clubs, organizations, and commitments on many transnational policy issues. This proliferation of international cooperation and networks can be illustrated by at least four interrelated trends. First of all, one can observe an increase, a sheer increase in the number of formal international organizations. International organizations, you can have long discussions about the proper definition of it, but one thing is clear, you notice a very strong increase during the last four decades of their numbers. There are the countings by the Union of International Associations. I'm not going to redo them here, but let me just uh, tell you that between 100, between 1990, when we counted 4,300 international organizations, we made a big leap to 2012, when we are at 7,696. So you have had hundreds of new intergovernmental organizations founded each year at all possible levels, bilateral, trilateral, sub-regional, regional, global, and so on, interregional as well. Secondly, we do not only increase, uh, we do not only see an increase in numbers of international organizations, but also in the participation in international organizations by many countries across the world also in particular middle-income countries. One way to capture that evolution is to look at its uh, evolution at the COF Political uh, Globalization Index, and that's why I'm showing here on this figure one. This COF Political Globalization Index, which is a part of the overall connectedness index that we draw up together with UNIDO, this index captures the membership in intergovernmental organizations, the number of international treaties which are signed and ratified by a country, but also the number of embassies across the world and participation in United Nations missions. Scores range from 0 to 100, 100 indicating a very high degree of political globalization and political uh, integration. Now this shows the evolution between 1970 and 2010 with a specific line indicating the participation by middle income countries and all countries in international affairs. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, one can observe a steady increase and a global integration of countries internationally. More and more countries participate in the multilateral arenas of international politics. And this is a kind of average trend for the world and for middle income countries. It doesn't show you the significant variation between individual uh, countries. That's the second trend. There's a third trend where countries are not only increasingly engaging in by, uh, multilateral international organizations and, uh, say, arenas, they're also more and more engaging in bilateral international cooperation. 
Now I show you this second graph, which is somewhat puzzling. Well, what is this? Well, many countries are, especially in the context of economic cooperation, pursuing bilateral agreements. This is clearly in, in illustrated, and so I come to this graph, by the increase in bilateral investment treaties. Germany set the precedent back in 1959 um, by starting up a, a strong number of bilateral state-to-state -state investment uh, treaties. Since then, we have seen, especially over the last decade, a real proliferation of those bits. By the end of 2011, UNCTAD counted 2,833 of those bits in force. This proliferation, which you see here on this uh, uh, figure, you see how countries link to each other through the bits which they have signed. And what emerges is a very dense network of bilateral agreements between countries. And you also see that some countries are far more connected through bits than others. At the core of the graph, nearly illegible, I would say, you see those countries with many bits. And in the outer circle are those countries which signed only a few bilateral investment treaties. In addition, there are now more than 300 free trade agreements. And you know, coming from the European Union, I can tell you that you know plurilateral free trade agreements are the big hype in the European Union. This is partly due with the blocking of the Doha development Okay, that about my graphs. I have a fourth development, which is on top of all these formal forms of multilateral, bilateral engagement, there is an incredibly interesting um, increase in the number of informal or issue-specific networks. Now, there is no nice graph to be shown here. There are no official records of this. And it is very hard to determine their nature and their setup. But if you choose, for instance, one particular policy issue, you will immediately find many international networks and, and um, knowledge platforms. Take, for example, climate change and low emission development strategies. CLEAN, the Coordinated Low Emission Assistance Network, has made an inventory of international and a regional uh, knowledge platforms which deal with low emission strategies, they have identified a few dozen of those hybrid networks dealing with low emissions. Such networks are extremely interesting because they really typically involve multiple stakeholders, such as governments, intergovernmental organizations, NGOs, academia, uh, business, and so on and so forth. And they, of course, also aim to diffuse information and generate policy learning. Now come to my, if you wish, policy um, uh, conclusions or, or, if you wish, implications. What emerges from these trends? It's a complex international institutional environment with many actors, many linkages, which poses several challenges for both states and for multilateral organizations. Those challenges are indeed highlighted in our networks for um, prosperity reports. From the perspective of each individual country, this increase in international cooperation results at least in two very important direct challenges. First of all, for those countries which are less integrated in the international system, for instance, they only participate in few intergovernment organizations or they only have a limited number of bilateral agreements, for such countries the big challenge is to become more integrated, more connected. Our reports with UNIDO show clearly that some countries are indeed much more connected and networked than others. What emerges from this is not so much a division between North and South, but between highly networked countries and less networked countries. Countries moving from the periphery to the core and grasping the importance of being indeed connected. Our hypothesis here is that countries that understand the importance of networks can develop distinct advantages in their pursuit of prosperity. Second challenge, for the well-connected countries, being involved in many different international constellations and being linked through different connections to other countries raises the challenge of how to make an efficient use of these connections. These network connections may serve many purposes. The most important one of 
from the perspective of our yeah, joint initiative, is to facilitate policy learning, information exchange, and knowledge um, dissemination on a range number of policy issues. And in order to maximize information diffusion and knowledge creation, we have argued in our first um, Networks for Prosperity report that one does not only need to increase the number of network connections, process which is currently happening at a fast pace, as I've just illustrated, one also has to deepen, to embed these network connections, make them also sustainable, sustained network connections, which allow for frequent interaction and dialogue in order to generate trust between partners, facilitate information exchange, knowledge creation, and so on. How to do that? That's a key question. We know from research in economics and psychology that trust building and embedding network relations is often a function of face-to-face -face interaction over a longer period of time. Hence, building effective networks requires time and investment. This brings opportunity costs. As a result, you have to do some strategic thinking. What do we want to achieve? How do we, do we want to achieve it? With whom? And so on. With regard to your network involvement, and that's a real key issue. Now, the proliferation, I'm coming to my end, Mr. Chairman, the proliferation of international cooperation, which is increasingly taking this network form, poses also significant challenges for the more traditional multilateral organizations, especially those with regard to their role, especially with regard to their role as policy facilitators and knowledge managers. They are confronted with a significant transformation. This transformation is one in which knowledge is or was managed within the boundaries of only a few multilateral organizations to an entirely new environment in which knowledge moves in and out of organizations depending on the networks in which these organizations operate. How to deal with this will have significant implications for the design and management, including the human resources management, of the more traditional multilateral organizations. This might even give rise to some serious tension or a paradox, because on the one hand, knowledge is a key asset for international organizations. Many uh, international organizations act as knowledge and expertise centers and diffuse knowledge and information across the world. We speak here in the shadow of the Bretton Woods institutions. On the other hand, moving towards network organizations, which increasingly rely on external expertise and knowledge, might hamper their function as knowledge centers, because they will not have any more the sole ownership over the knowledge, and uh, the knowledge is becoming ever more diffuse. Hence, a kind of tension which emerged is one in which the international organizations rely on their own knowledge base to perform some of their key functions, but are also facing increased challenges to manage knowledge in a network context. Addressing these challenges and managing knowledge is one of the areas on which I think much of our future work needs to concentrate. We already observe that several international organizations are experimenting in a very interesting and creative way with new forms of network formation and knowledge management. I could give you a couple of recent examples of that, but I'm not going to elaborate on it because my time is up. What is just very interesting is that indeed some of those initiatives merit further studying because indeed it shows how multilateral organizations are undergoing a kind of transformation themselves based upon this phenomenon of knowledge networks. Whether this all generates more added value, all these networks, we have to see that also needs to be further investigated, but those experiments and transformations are really extremely interesting. I think many uh, local, regional, uh, global organizations can really start learning much more from each other in this kind of knowledge um, networking uh, society. To investigate these profound challenges, are, I have already referred to the partnership between UNIDO and our Leuven Center for Global Governance, and we intend really to continue this close cooperation because, as you see, there is still a very broad and deep research agenda ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Voiders. I'm going to ask uh, Tim Meyer from uh, the University of Georgia Law School now to have the floor. Thank you, Tim, for coming to be with us.
Uh, my pleasure, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dan, and thank you, uh, Kazuki, for um, uh, the invitation to, to, to contribute to this um, very fine report. Um, the question I want to talk about today, uh, uh, picking up where Jan left off to a large extent, is uh, what is the role of um, international organizations in governing networks? Um, uh, Jan mentioned um, the issue of trust um, and how it can be developed in face-to-face -face context in dealing with networks. Um, but when we're talking about the diffusion of knowledge, the diffusion of information, um, particularly scientific and expert technical um, uh, information coming from experts, um, uh, institutions play an important role um, in fostering trust and in, in fostering the credibility of um, the information that's shared. Just to give a couple of uh, uh, examples, um, across a, a variety of, of um, policy issues relevant to development, we can think about, um, for example, how do you diffuse um, best, best practices for regulating um, tobacco uh, under, for example, the uh, WHO's Framework uh, Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, how can studies about the feasibility of different forms of renewable energy um, be effectively diffused to countries that are considering trying to change their um, energy pathway from a fossil fuel uh, dependent energy pathway to a more uh, renewable and sustainable kind um, of, energy, of energy pathway? This is an incredibly important um, uh, question because lots of the scientific and technical um, research is done in uh, a relatively small handful of countries. Um, to give you an example um, from, from renewable energy, 75% <clears throat> of um, the uh, exporting of renewable energy technology occurs just between developed um, countries. Um, of those uh, uh, exports that occur to um, uh, developing uh, countries, uh, the lion's share go to only three countries, uh, China, Brazil, uh, and India. So as we were working on developing um, a clean and sustainable, in this case, um, uh, energy pathway that hopefully can solve both development objectives and environmental climate objectives, um, we have this um, major problem of how we ensure that the energy is, that the uh, information is in fact diffused in a way um, that helps uh, all countries um, uh, in, in achieving their um, um, development of, uh, goals. So I want to make um, uh, three uh, points. Um, the first is that we have to problematize, I think, in terms of thinking in the role, about the role of institutions, we have to problematize the idea of knowledge. Um, because knowledge is not something that is um, just simply handed out by, by scientists or by experts. Rather, it's something that has, uh, has to have meaning in the context of particular policy problems. Um, and we can talk in this, in this fashion about uh, information or, or scientific information um, being usable and being credible. Um, by being usable, uh, I mean that the information has to actually be relevant to the policy problem that is actually facing um, policymakers. Uh, a scientist in a lab who is studying some sort of abstract problem is unlikely to come up with uh, a scientific result that has an immediate application um, to uh, uh, some particular um, policy problem. Uh, uh, that faces um, a, uh, a policymaker in some country. To give you an example, um, it, in 2009, the International Renewable Energy Agency was founded. The IRENA, his mission is to essentially um, coordinate a network of countries and try to facilitate the diffusion of information related to um, renewable, um, renewable energy technologies. Uh, it turns out that, that different kinds of renewable energy technologies are useful for different kinds of projects. Okay? It's not useful to simply share information generally about renewable energy technology. If you're located in a particularly dry part of, of the world, one of your major challenges is going to be desalinization, you need to, which is very energy intensive. You need to, to take the salt out of the water in order to solve your water needs. That's very energy intensive. Therefore, you're going to have a particular interest um, in uh, clean energy desalinization projects. One of the things IRENA has tried to do is really focus on the needs of its client states and the particular needs of its client states by doing very targeted um, country-specific um, studies in an effort to ensure that information is indeed usable. Uh, the second issue, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about this, is, is the issue of credibility. Um, the information that comes out of um, both, both governments that are, are giving foreign assistance, like the United States or European countries, as well as international uh, institutions, has to be credible to uh, countries that are, are uh, seeking advice as to um, uh, acceptable policies, um, best practices, uh, and scientific, scientific information. Uh, to give you an example, in 2009, uh, there was the H1N1 outbreak. The World Health Organization recommended um, that uh, countries stockpile Tamiflu uh, as a means of um, uh, treating uh, this outbreak. Um, subsequent research, is, and many countries did, um, it yielded uh, billions of dollars in revenue for Tamiflu's uh, manufacturer. 
Um, subsequent research has shown that uh, the WHO and national health authorities, the CDC in the United States and European health, health authorities, didn't have access to um, the basic underlying data um, that about Tamiflu's effectiveness, and therefore um, potentially um, uh, significant amounts of money were wasted by these governments because the international organizations and the national uh, health authorities simply didn't have access to the right kinds of information. That calls into question um, the credibility of, of some of these uh, multilateral institutions, or institutions like the WHO, and we have to think about how we solve that. Um, how we solve that problem? How do we make sure that institutions like the WHO are able to deliver um, credible uh, and effective, uh, usable information? Institutions matter here. The minister, uh, in his um, introductory remarks, talked about the uh, United Nations and its role in, I think the phrase he used was exporting um, uh, democracy and self-determination. Institutions play a role in exporting um, policies at, at, a, at a much smaller um, level here. Um, and uh, the form of these institutions matter. In some contexts, it's going to make sense for in, uh, institutions that deal in scientific and technical information um, to be independent of large multilateral institutions, to not be tied to specific kinds of um, uh, multilateral negotiating processes. I think here, of, for example, the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change and the negotiating process. To what extent should we be decoupling efforts to diffuse renewable energy technology from the UNFCCC process, which has become bogged down? You can similarly think in the trade and investment area of trying to decouple cooperation on certain kinds of environmental trade um, from uh, the Doha Round process and the WTO's um, processes, the various disputes um, uh, going on under um, uh, the SPS and TBT agreements um, in the WTO. At the same time, um, independence has severe costs um, where, the, where the credibility of information is concerned. It is often incredibly useful, and I think this is often underappreciated, it is often incredibly useful um, for governments to be able to have, um, and particularly governments that are um, trying to uh, uh, absorb best practices that are t the targets for aid to have oversight of um, the work of these scientific and technical bodies. Um, when uh, European countries um, initially tried to deal with the um, uh, problem of persistent organic pollutants, um, they wanted to have a, a European convention, a it was a protocol to an existing convention, uh, to deal with um, these persistent organic pollutants. These are things that travel, um, they're, they're byproducts essentially of economic activity that travel through um, water systems and, and the food chain. Um, they're a serious health risk. Uh, and the problem was that Eastern European states at the time were not really equipped to participate um, in the generation of scientific recommendations. Nevertheless, it was deemed absolutely critical that the Eastern European states have the ability to participate in in the preparation of the scientific assessment that was going to result in um, legal rules because their buy-in as to the scientific recommendations and not just the legal rules was absolutely, um, was absolutely critical. Therefore, uh, a number of, of Western European states put money on the table to encourage um, the participation um, by, uh, by these Eastern European states. And by all accounts, it was very successful. That in, in ga engaging countries and allowing them an oversight role at the scientific and expert stage um, facilitated uh, and encouraged um, uh, the successful uh, cooperation on, on persistent organic pollutants. Um, my third point, and, and I will uh, conclude here, um, is um, that it, and a number of, of speakers this morning have touched on this, but that uh, it increasingly looks like governance of these kinds of networks is most effectively accomplished uh, in smaller institutions that are decoupled um, from large multilateral organizations. The role of oversight, the role of um, uh, non-European, non-American countries uh, in participating in these institutions is absolutely criti critical for the credibility point, but it is often, uh, it seems to be um, a potential ingredient for success that they not be linked to um, uh, major uh, negotiating process like the UNFCCC, like the WTO's process. And by way of example, I'll talk about the founding of IRENA. Um, IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, um, was sponsored um, to a large extent um, by the German government. And at the time, um, there was a serious conversation about where IRENA should um, be housed. Should it be part of the UNFCCC process, Im embedded in the UN process? Should it be part of the International, en uh, International Energy Agency, which as um, many of you probably know is an OECD um, organization that has existed uh, since the 70s. Um, it does a lot of work on, um, on energy, but its uh, primary focus historically um, has been petroleum. Um, and there was a big push from um, some of the other uh, uh, European um, 
countries to think about whether or not it made sense to house this either as a as a um, environmental initiative within the uh, within the UNFCCC, as an energy initiative um, within the IEA. Um, the IEA has been trying to boost its its renewable energy um, uh, profile and therefore was eager to to get this. And the Germans were quite uh, insistent that um, it was very important that this be an independent body and an independent or organization so that the, the, the function of developing these feasibility studies, um, the, the uh, role of coordinating networks, intellectual property is very important for renewable energy. Intellectual property creates a lot of barriers to the diffusion of, of knowledge in the, in the clean energy area. Um, trying to build networks that would knock down those, um, uh, those barriers erected by uh, intellectual property. Um, that it was critical for the functioning of that mission that uh, IRENA not be uh, affiliated with any of these larger, um, larger bodies. Um, the IEA was deemed to be a credibility risk because of its petroleum um, uh, links, uh, not uh, friendly to, uh, to clean technology. And the UNFCCC um, was thought to be uh, uh, sufficiently embroiled um, in larger political, uh, political and legal uh, debates that it would deter from the mission. Um, IRENA is, of course, only one example. Uh, one size uh, does not fit all. Um, as, as Kazuki mentioned, one of the things we need is, is much greater research into how organizations like IRENA can be effectively structured to encourage um, the diffusion of information in specific areas. Different kinds of information probably call for different kinds of institutional solutions. But I do think that IRENA um, uh, offers one particular uh, model that we might look to um, as a way to encourage and foster uh, the uh, sharing of um, uh, credible and usable scientific information. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim. I think uh, this is a very nice segue into Jerry O'Brien's remarks. I think Jerry's remarks, who Jerry's with USAID. He's the Deputy Director of the Office of Science and Technology at USAID. I think will also be a nice bridge into the conversation we're going to be having about a series of specific networks for solving global problems. We've talked about the big picture through the minister. We've been having sort of a discussion at, at a at a at a uh, at a largely um, at, a, at the larger picture level in this panel. I think Jerry, you're going to help us kind of close it out. Thank you, Jerry. The floor is yours. Uh, well, thanks. Good morning. Um, so I, I'd like to share a little bit about. Um, are thinking about knowledge networks from the donor perspective, particularly science and technology knowledge networks. Um, uh, the Office of Science and Technology, a relatively new part of USAID, um, and our stated purpose is to help the agency and developing countries uh, use science and technology to better achieve their development goals. So obviously we think a lot about the importance of uh, science and technology capacity building as a tool for development. Um, developing countries represent 80% of the world's population, yet only 28% of uh, the world's scientists. And so this is a stark reminder of the lack of innovative potential necessary for developing countries to solve the real life challenges uh, affecting their countries and their people. So we see uh, science and technology capacity of a country as a core development prerequisite. Uh, so that uh, development interventions can be sustainable, uh, can be institutionalized and scaled within with local ingenuity and local capabilities, and renewed with local scientific and technological innovation. Uh, so that countries can be proactive players in their own development, uh, so that we can ensure that uh, science and technology advances are contextually and environmentally appropriate, uh, and so that uh, science and technology can act as a kind of infrastructure for absorptive capacity in, in developing countries. So we have been preaching this gospel inside the agency for, for a couple of years now, and at least the folks in the chorus are, are fairly receptive. <laughs> Um, and what we're seeing o o over the past year or so is a much more explicit uh, discussion of science and technology uh, in our strategic planning and our program designs. Uh, for example, USAID Indonesia just released its uh, new five-year strategy, and of its four development objectives, uh, increasing the science and technology capacity of the government of Indonesia is, is one of them. That's the first time we've seen that. Um, other countries, uh, country missions, uh, have explicit uh, S&T goals uh, as, as part of, of their development objectives, or, or we see it as a theme woven across the entire strategy. Um, so we're, we're delighted at that, uh, that development inside the agency. Uh, I, I would note that we are seeing that happen in the country development strategies in middle income countries, though. Uh, which leads me to kind of another conversation that's going on in the agency. Um, there's an interesting conversation going on in our policy bureau right now uh, about how, how best we should uh, embrace the goal of eradicating extreme poverty in a generation. Uh, and uh, the folks in our policy bureau uh, have suggested that we need 
differential strategies for different kinds of countries. Uh, and when they are talking about uh, middle income countries, they are, um, the core approach that they are proposing is to harness science, technology, innovation, and knowledge sharing as the best way to help countries eliminate uh, extreme poverty. Uh, so our comparative advantage as an agency now is not in providing financial assistance or traditional development assistance, but in uh, knowledge exchange, sharing of lessons learned, policy reform, and by helping countries create the ecosystem of science, technology, and innovation leadership. Um, we're delighted that there's some policy coherence between the Science and Technology Office and the Policy Office. We, we were delighted to see that. We don't always see that, but we think that's, that's a good sign. Um, so as I started uh, casting about trying to put my thoughts together around this, I, I started going to uh, technical bureau colleagues and saying, gee, what are you guys doing in knowledge networks? What, what's your thought about that? And they said, in what? Uh, but once I explained to them what I was uh, casting about for, they said, oh yeah, no, we do a lot of that. Um, uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> observation is that when I first started thinking about this, I, I thought of the Arab Spring. And I thought clearly, the, the I'm not sure if what Arab youth um, were, were creating in that instance were technically knowledge networks, uh, but they were certainly in that ballpark. Uh, interesting to note that all those countries are middle income countries. Um, but it seems that, that middle income countries have the necessary combination of, of characteristics to allow spontaneous and user driven knowledge networks to spring up and, and to be effective. Um, but I, I, I did find lots of examples in the agency of knowledge networks um, uh, in rather different kinds. So. For example, actually, let me step back. Early examples in, in the science and technology arena of a knowledge network is the open drug discovery uh, process. This is a, a process through which scientists uh, collaborated on, on looking for treatments for uh, TB, malaria, and other uh, neglected tropical diseases. Uh, been around for a long time, for decades. Uh, engaged a ton of new players and, and actually contributed significantly to, to challenging this concept of intellectual property as a barrier for this kind of uh, knowledge sharing. So um, we think science and technology as a, as a field is particularly well suited uh, for this kind of knowledge management approach. Um, as I said, in the agency, we, we find lots of examples of knowledge management efforts that, that we have supported. Uh, a very early one was called FrameNet, and it started as a, as a community of practice a couple decades ago, uh, uh, working with folks in the natural resource management field. Uh, it, it started in Africa as a face-to-face -face, series of meetings and workshops and, and networking opportunities, hard copy pop, uh, publications designed to share successes and failures among practitioners. Uh, the, uh, FrameNet moved very early to an internet platform and, and very quickly became a global community uh, and a real knowledge network, as, as we would define it. Um, but that is rather the exception than the rule. Um, as I talk to folks in, in the agency who are talking about how we're supporting knowledge uh, networks and knowledge management, uh, more typical as an example of a, of a project called Adapt Asia Pacific. It's a knowledge network that focuses on climate change and resilience. Uh, and it does the usual knowledge network kind of things, uh, but it has a very specific focus on linking funding organizations with eligible recipients and helps uh, those recipients and, and countries prepare fundable projects. So there, there's a pretty clear tension uh, between the knowledge management goals here and, and the, the USAID strategic goals. Um, actually, I, quote from the, the, the project documents, as with all its regional programs, RDMA seeks to demonstrate measurable impact on the ground and the creation of sustainable programs, and we will measure program impact in terms of, and then it goes on to say exactly how we'll measure that. So that's a little bit of, of attention there, um, but nonetheless, important knowledge management aspects. Uh, there are quite a few of these across the agency. Um, I, I won't go into a great discussion of them, but there, there are a number of them. Uh, our office has just uh, established the, what we call the Higher Education Solutions Network, which is a $100 million five-year uh, project through which we are creating, uh, we have created seven development labs at universities around the world. Uh, they include over 119 partners in, uh, in 38 countries. Each lab is working on a specific uh, interdisciplinary aspect of development science. Um, and one of them, the, I think that's quite interesting, is at Makerere University in Uganda, and it, it has created a, what they call the Resilient Africa Network, which is a network of, of African universities that looking at the science of resilience uh, and, and creating a network for the, the sharing and creation of this, of, of this science. Uh, our, our goal, however, is to create a broader network of all of these uh, actors um, and to support the widest possible creation of and sharing of uh, knowledge uh, in, in this field of, of development science. 
again, largely focused on the development community, on us and on, on you, uh, and not so much uh, focused on um, the, the actual uh, sort of participants in, in the, the, the network. Um, so let me just close with a couple of observations about um, so our role in, in all of this and, and sort of what the challenges are and where we might be going. Um, as an agency, we're under pretty significant pressure to measure and demonstrate the impact of what we fund. Um, we have to justify how we spend your taxpayer dollars, actually. Um, and Congress keeps asking us, so we keep having to tell them. Um, our definition of evidence is pretty narrow, and the tools we use to measure it are suited to, to, to measuring that narrow definition. Um, we struggle with a annual funding cycle. Um, and clearly, the way our missions are staffed with foreign service officers that rotate every uh, several years, um, this creates a set of incentives that make it hard for us uh, as an agency to invest in systemic approaches to development and to knowledge management, um, which are inherent, inherently uh, long-term, difficult to measure, and have diffuse impact. Um, and so that skews our investments in uh, activities that have measurable outcomes and short-term impact. So that's, there's, a, there's again, a, a, an inherent tension between the, the incentives and constraints that we work under and, and achieving the kinds of goals that knowledge management uh, offers us. Um, the other big constraint that I've alluded to is that m many of our efforts in this arena really are focused on creating and sharing knowledge for our purposes, or as I said, for your purposes, the broader development community's purposes, and not for uh, developing country actors. Uh, and we know that the, the most vibrant and successful uh, knowledge networks are those that are user-driven uh, and inclusive of, of developing country actors. Um, they are the ones who know what they need, and we should be uh, following that lead, obviously. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, closing comments, if we as an agency really want to reap the benefit of knowledge management, particularly in this middle income country environment where that should be the way we should be uh, operating, uh, we need to do a couple things. We need to make the case for the benefits of a systemic approach to knowledge management as an end in itself and not as a kind of a, as a, a tool to achieve other goals. Um, I think we need to make explicit the knowledge management aspects or elements of many of the programs that we have. As I said, they're, they're often implicit or, or not, not teased out. Um, I think we need to consolidate and expand the knowledge networks that, that are uh, in, in uh, be, being supported by the agency. Um, uh, we shift our emphasis clearly to the users, or at least better balance our interest in the users and, and our strategic interests. I mean, I, those constraints that I mentioned earlier are not going to go away, uh, but if we make more explicit the, the, the role of the user here, I think we can shift the balance uh, more effectively in that direction. And finally, uh, and importantly, I think we need to be willing to make the, the case for these longer term goals and lo longer planning horizon, uh, because investing in these kinds of uh, approaches to development uh, clearly is a much longer term exercise that, than, than the, the, the typical planning horizon that we struggle with. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much, Jerry. I think the panel's going to take a few questions, uh, so I'll uh, open the floor. My friend Alina Jaskowski up here. Hello, um, and uh, I'm Alina Jaskowski. I'm the director of the DC Office for Global Development Network, and we are an organization that focuses on research capacity building. Uh, so this is very much of uh, interest for us. So thank you, Dan and CSIS, for organizing this. Uh, I really thought that um, the keynote speaker was excellent and hoped that his speech would be available. I'm not sure if he'll be able to uh, provide copies or, or have a link on, on the web, um, because I do think it's a good thing to share with everybody. And uh, I appreciate um, being exposed to his UNIDO report. So I was wondering, with the UNIDO report, uh, is this plan then to be done every two years, this index? And if so, um, you know, how comprehensive is your tracking? What kind of methodology are you using? And, uh, and if this is something that is fully funded by UNIDO or how, how it's working. Thank you. Why don't we take one or two more questions if other folks have questions. We'll do this World Bank style. If, you, if folks have other questions, comments. If not, we can go ahead and I'll ask Dr. Voiders to respond to that. Or, uh, the, amb the ambassador here from Costa Rica. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Saul Weisleiter. I'm the Deputy Permanent Representative of Costa Rica to the UN in New York. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Wouters, uh, he didn't have time uh, during his presentation, but if he can uh, tell us a little bit 
on at least one of the examples uh, that, that you mentioned. Because for many of us, even though we have been catching a little bit better, but the issue still remains a little bit abstract. Uh, it, it, we have moved into a more concrete uh, understanding, but I, I, my feeling is that for many of us, it's still a little bit abstract. So, so we need more examples. Uh, one could even say that in today's world, what doesn't happen without uh, networks? So in a way, uh, to convince us that networks are important, well, yes, it's important, but, but it's not so, unless you show it in a more concrete way. Thank you very, thank you very much. I think the second panel, I think what, what we've imagined is, is that we'll have an, a chance to talk about three different, three different networks that cover, uh, cover different challenges, global challenges that I think will get to this. Our, our thought was to do this in a, but I think, I think your point is very well taken, so perhaps Dr. Vowders will have a chance to respond to that. Thank you. Uh, Kazuki, why don't you respond to the first question, if you would, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Dan. The, the plan we have is, uh, actually, so far we have um, issued um, this report on an annual basis. The first one, um, two years ago, and this one actually came out last year in November. Uh, we are planning for this year, um, uh, to um, bring out one uh, additional report which is going to look at networks and sustainability issues um, as, as, as the, the, the primary focus of the, um, uh, of the report um, and hope that um, uh, we will continue, um, if not on an annual, then uh, at least on an um, biannual basis with the, with the report. And um, of course, um, uh, if uh, there is interest in, um, uh, in partnering with us on this um, particular um, activity, uh, that's uh, that's the beauty of networks. Um, <laughs> um, let's uh, exchange cards and um, uh, just one um, uh, because you were asking about um, the funding issue. So far, Unido has been funding this with the um, support of the government of Spain. Um, the government of Spain um, uh, was uh, very generous, actually, um, uh, uh, funding this entire initiative so far, um, and. Uh, uh, what we know is that um, uh, Spain has uh, also uh, uh, renewed its, um, uh, its interest in working with middle-income countries, which is a, a, a traditional focus of, um, of Spain, particularly in Latin America. And um, we hope, obviously, that um, uh, this partnership with Spain will um, continue on this, um, uh, in this particular uh, initiative. But we are very happy also to look at um, other opportunities um, when it's coming to um, funding. Of this um, of this initiative, um, as for the for for the um, the the, the, the uh, connectedness index, I think um, I leave it to um, uh, to Jan to uh, to respond. Yeah, so Jan, uh, theoretical versus can you give us some examples and uh, how do you make it so that our head doesn't hurt when we think about this issue? <laughs> We should have a second seminar yeah, about yeah. this, but, um, you know, um, well, first of all, in, in the two reports which we have been doing, and in particular the, the second one of November last year, there are a couple of case studies that indeed look at the way in which, for instance, from a business point of view, from an international organization, UNIDO and other organizations' point of view, these networks are added value. But I could not elaborate in my speech where actually two examples I had in mind when speaking about this um, last topic about um, how multilateral organizations have to cope with this network society. In fact, there are two examples in which we are ourselves in Leuven involved in as academics. The first one is the World Bank. The World Bank here, and I visited the vice president um, uh, in that respect, uh, Hassan Sisse, uh, a few days ago. Uh, the World Bank has developed a whole network of scholars, uh, practitioners, and analysts that focus on law, development, and justice. It's a, no it's a huge network. You create a kind of partnership agreement, and you're part of uh, more than 250 uh, partners. It's divided in a whole set of working groups that share up-to-date research, debate, and identify key priority areas for researchers and policymakers on a broad range of issues on law, justice, and uh, development. It brings not just together um, academics, it brings together practitioners from an enormous amount of international financial institutions, legal counsel, and so on. So, I mean, it really creates, I mean, you, they have their annual week more or less that they do in Washington DC. This year it will be in November. So you bring actually together not just knowledge that cannot 
always be present in one single institution, but you connect the various, if you wish, stakeholders, constituencies where knowledge is being produced. Uh, especially, I must say, for us academics, this is extremely rewarding. It's not just about exchanging business cards. It's really about, if you wish, being able to exchange the actual results of your academic research and make you as an academic also much more aware of, you know, where are the real life issues that matter, where, you know, academic, uh, if you wish, uh, important issues uh, meet the policy needs. And I think that's something which we absolutely need to cultivate much more, not just here in Europe, uh, I think more, more interregionally as well. Because one thing I have to say, my experience in Europe, we do have European uh, research programs funded by the European Commission, but they are still very much, you know, based in Europe. And I, I'm the first one to say we should cultivate much more interregional um, research cooperation. The problem is, as in so many cases of international institutions and governance, there is no overarching structure for that. And countries still very much think about research and research funding as something part of their national spheres of yeah. sovereignty. I mean, I think we should open up those markets, uh, also in order to stimulate the best possible results and also deal a little bit with the enormous overlap that exists. Overlap, but also gaps. Uh, and there, for the gaps, I think, the great uh, utility of, of such, um, say, networks which multilateral organizations like the World Bank stimulate is that you need, you confront the knowledge uh, production with each other and you make uh, academics better aware of the real life needs of policymakers. John, thank you very much. I think what we're going to do is we're going to stop here so that we can get back on schedule. Uh, if you all will uh, promise to be back in 10 minutes, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes. Thanks very much.
Okay, we're going to get started. Hey, while the folks are uh, getting seated, uh, we had a discussion that was, we're going to go from the theoretical to the applied. We're going to talk about a series of case studies that are related to networked networks and networks of networks. We're going to talk about the issues of knowledge sharing within them, governance, how they're formed, how they're maintained, how they do their work. Uh, I think this issue of knowledge instead of finance as a driver, I think will be, I think will be one of the underlying themes within this. So I think it was a uh, I think we'll have a, uh, a very interesting and rich discussion of three different case studies. Uh, I'm going to ask Barbara Chrysler, though, who is the manager for UNIDO's business partnerships, to first uh, kick it off. So, Barbara, uh, the floor is yours. Much, uh, very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I thought after the very insightful uh, and thought-provoking uh, discussions this morning that I'll start you off with a very quick uh, video uh, on the way UNIDO manages business partnerships, which are partnerships with uh, the private sector. And then I would be very happy to, as Dan was saying, to get a bit more into the practicalities of uh, business partnerships, which after all are a certain form of networks and networking. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll yeah. just get us Hey, Masi, I think we've got a technical issue here. I'm not sure. Sorry, I just don't know. <laughs> Ah. UNIDO has a special place in the UN system. The focus of our work is to accelerate industrial development in developing countries as well as in emerging economies. Industrial development is important, but it needs to be sustainable, inclusive and not achieved at the expense of natural resources. We are happy to see that our views are being shared by a growing number of corporate actors. So by engaging in business partnerships, we can take advantage of the creativity as well as the know-how of the private sector in order to further increase the development impact of our work. Major uh, multinational companies, uh, retail industry manufacturers, they are trying to develop their supply chain in a more responsible and sustainable way and, and they require the sustainability of their sourcing. They, they need the suppliers. They are capable to produce at the right time the right products. This involves uh, uh, assisting local suppliers and producers to comply and conform with market requirements and international standards. They comply with social standards, environmental standards. They can be productive and efficient. And in doing this, UNIDO has the necessary experience and tools to help those suppliers accessing regional and international value chains and trade systems. There is a benefit for all. The suppliers, their families, the, the major buyers and the consumers. Industry plays a major role in job creation. Partnering with the private sector has allowed UNIDO to harness the know-how and the technology to meet the job market needs. Such partnerships facilitate linkages between the private sector and public training institutions to transfer important skills to local people, especially the young. They support them to find work or set up their own businesses. UNIDO has an extensive field network. We have offices in over 50 developing countries. Working in partnership, we can ensure that our initiatives reach the people on the ground and that they are sustainable. To address global economic challenges such as food security or environmental sustainability or energy access, we are building an increasing number of what we call multi-stakeholder platforms. 
Dieser Plattform that involve a wide range of actors from the public sector, the private sector, as well as civil society to achieve systemic change within entire industry sectors. By pooling our resources, we are able to make sure that we add value across the entire value chain. By bringing together different actors, we try to encourage the exchange of uh, information, uh, foster innovation and promote best practices. The private sector often holds the key skills, expertise and technological solutions. And with Unido's catalytic support, we can jointly adapt products and services to local needs at scale and level that result in transformational change. To help industries move away from the current uh, unsustainable manufacturing model to a greener, more uh, resource efficient production process. And in this way, upscale and mainstream the greening of industries. As partners, we can deliver sustainable and clean energy solutions to millions. So why are we working with the private sector? To create shared value. More jobs increase livelihoods. Promote inclusive green growth. Achieve greater scale and impact. Transfer knowledge and technology. Add value and innovation. Great. All right. All right, thank you very much. I thought this was perhaps a good way to, to kick off uh, this session. And what I would like to do is basically to um, talk to you today about the um, specific networks that uh, we and you need to very much foster, which are around uh, partnering with the private sector. I think after this morning's discussion and what the Honorable uh, Ambassador as well as Stan have been uh, alluding to is that the years of traditional development assistance are certainly uh, going to be over or we already see the end of that. There is no more the traditional, the north, the, the, the rich north giving the south uh, funding in order to, 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 defer, to develop further. We will see less and less of that. Uh, we are in a fundamental transition phase uh, where we see new forms of relationships and partnerships. And uh, as um, as Kazuki and, and, and others also noted, that there are new innovative ways of partnering and the Networks for Prosperity is obviously one important um, initiative in that, in that respect. Another one, and this is one that uh, we are very much uh, working on in UNIDO, is to see how we can further work with the private sector to transfer knowledge and know-how in order to further increase the developmental impact uh, of, our, of our technical cooperation programs. And in that, uh, we have now a growing number of successful partnerships, um, which very much make us realize that this is a certainly um, a very promising way of further cooperating uh, in the future. What is very clear when we, when we uh, work with the private sector is that obviously we have to recognize that there are a different agendas that are coming together. At the end of the day, the business of business remains business. Businesses are not NGOs, they are not uh, philanthropic organizations, and we very much need to recognize that when we are when we're partnering with them. And in order to create sustainable mm -hmm. networks and partnerships, uh, we need to make sure that there is an value added for all partners involved. We are not talking about here these philanthropic traditional approaches where large companies are writing a check, you know, to do some nice project somewhere and then it's pretty much over with a nice present photo opportunity. But we are talking about how to engage the private sector in its core business and to make sure that we can transfer their knowledge to the benefit of our ultimate beneficiaries, which are small and medium-sized enterprises in developing countries. And since more and more companies are sourcing from developing countries uh, in, in their local, regional and global supply chains, these kind of partnerships will become uh, ever more important. So um, what I wanted to, to basically uh, I'll just, hold on a second. I wanted to show to you in 
a slide some of the ongoing partnerships that we oh, thank you Dan. <laughs> where is it now the ongoing partnerships that we currently have what is it they found a problem repair I don't know what the problem is. F5. F5. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Great. Exactly, knowledge, knowledge network. network. <laughs> so I, I just basically here in this slide wanted to show you uh, what we are talking about when we talk about business partnerships. I think we at UNIDO have certainly an advantage uh, being a UN organization with a specific mandate on industrial development, which makes us a very interesting and relevant partner for the private sector. Uh, I'm listing here the partnerships that we currently have uh, ongoing in UNIDO in different areas, whether it's in agro-industry, uh, technology, environment, or uh, energy and climate change. But it just basically shows um, there's a lot of room uh, for, for, for potential to upscale this further. I also wanted to uh, draw your attention to a relatively new form of partnerships, which I think in the context of uh, talking here about networks and networks for prosperity is, is very important because in addition to the traditional bilateral partnerships that are taking place between, let's say, a UN organization and a private sector a partner, we see more and more the development of what we call multi-stakeholder or transformational partnerships. These are partnerships that involve a large number of actors from the private sector, from governments, from academia, as well as uh, civil society and others, to address global development issues and achieve systemic change within entire industry sectors. Uh, we have a number of um, uh, initiatives that fit this category. One of them is the Green Industry Platform, which I will talk uh, to, to about in, in, in a second. Obviously, these partnerships, once they are successful, have the, the, um, the potential of a much larger impact in, in, on, the, on the global scale. The downside to that is, of course, and I think we should also not uh, uh, um, forget about it, is the complexity of such multi-stakeholder partnerships. And to, to bring them uh, up to, to a phase where they can actually show impact can be a really daunting uh, task because we already see in our bilateral partnerships that this is sometimes not an easy um, an easy uh, way of partnering. So bringing even more actors together uh, could potentially also be uh, quite challenging. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through this in detail. I'm very happy afterwards to, uh, to, to uh, provide more information. I just wanted to give you three quick examples of our ongoing partnerships. And I also have some uh, brochures here with me. So whoever is interested, please come and approach me uh, afterwards. One of them is a partnership that we have with uh, Microsoft. I don't think I need to introduce Microsoft, but Microsoft is a partner that I've been working with since 2000. 2006, and the focus of our work has been in Africa to, um, to, to allow and enable particularly small and medium-sized enterprises in rural areas to access ICT training, access uh, the internet, and be able to obtain updated information relevant to their business through, through this partnership. We are also working with Microsoft most recently now on a project around e-waste, electronic waste, which is one of the uh, fastest growing um, challenges when it comes to recycling issues. And in fact, we will hold a workshop with uh, Microsoft and others in two weeks in, in Cape Town on, on that issue. 
The other project I would like to bring to your attention, again it's in the IT sector, but I thought since we are here in the US, perhaps also interesting to pick some of our US partners, is with Hewlett Packard, where we have uh, a project in 15 countries all over the globe. This is truly a global partnership that we have since 2008. And it's a training curriculum that combines entrepreneurship training with IT skills, which is quite an innovative way of um, providing these kind of um, knowledge, particularly to young people as well as aspiring entrepreneurs. And I think the results that you see on the screen uh, speak for, for themselves. The last example that I would like to give to you is the example of the Green Industry Platform. As I mentioned before, this is one of our multi-stakeholder platform. It was launched last year uh, at the Rio conference. It's a partnership that we have launched together with UNEP, the env environmental program. And uh, the objective of the Green Industry Platform is to assist the greening of existing industries as well as the creation of new green industries. It's a, a global initiative. We have 142 members uh, that have signed up to uh, up to date and the numbers are, are still growing. You, could, you can see here um, a, a quite uh, important participations of businesses, government as well as international uh, organizations. And and we have just kicked off our first advisory board meeting in Paris uh, a few weeks ago and are very much now focusing in the first year on uh, looking at uh, green industry activities in the food and beverage sector. So this is very much seen as a global platform to share best practice and to share knowledge uh, between like-minded partners on what can be done in the area of uh, advancing uh, green industry and sustainable production patterns. Um, I think I would leave it uh, to, to this short introduction uh, for now. I just wanted to, since this is after all a conference on uh, middle income countries, wanted to um, ensure you that in this next phase of our uh, program, we very much are reaching out and want to reach out to uh, private sector partners in middle income countries. So far this is, has been more the traditional approach of working with the, the big boys, so to speak, but for us uh, working uh, and identifying suitable private sector partners in middle income countries and encouraging these south-south uh, knowledge transfer is very much um, an area of focus for UNIDO in, in this uh, next year to come. So, thank Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to ask Bill Reese, who's the uh, CEO of the International Youth Foundation, to share with us a case study of the International Youth Foundation and uh, the work that it does, which it does in the form of networks. Bill, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dan. A week or so ago, I was here giving a different case study on employment and scaling, but today I, I'm glad to talk about something quite different. But it takes the two to. Uh, to, to tango, so to speak. Value chains and supply chains uh, are very important, and we've talked about them for years now in the industrial or commercial sectors, but they're, I think they're just as important in, in development, because as Barbara said, development is a complex set of processes. It does take multiple stakeholders. Frankly, just two probably don't do it. Uh, neither do three or four year projects, which a lot of donors want to get into. I'm going to fund you to do that and we'll do it for three years and then sustainability is, is if you can get someone to fund it for years four, five, and six. Uh, real development takes 10, 15, 20 years. Dan asked me to talk about our network and the International Youth Foundation really is a community of practice of about 250 well vetted, all locally governed, sustainable. They may need help, but they're not needing help to pay their light bill that month. Uh, nationally rooted uh, civil society organizations across about 70 countries. So it's a platform, really, for learning and sharing, and, and also for scaling and, and, putting, and, and, and leveraging projects. Um, we share a philosophy across this network. I call it horizontal and virtual because it's not vertical, with a headquarters here in the United States or somewhere else with a bunch of field offices. And it's virtual because we don't try to own or govern. 
the local institutions. We're there to work together around shared value, uh, sharing a philosophy, sharing values, and sharing standards of operations. It's all for us about positive youth development, but it, you could have another network doing gender issues or agricultural issues or, or you name it. Positive youth development for our foundation and for others who use those words, positive youth development, is that the outcomes you're looking for, and we're all talking about outcomes these days, the outcomes of a youth program put on by multiple stakeholders, government, business, and civil society, ought to be a healthy, civically engaged, employed adult, not a youth. I mean, the, the ROI on a youth program is a 50-year successful adult, hopefully. Uh, together, this network of ours, about 250 organizations, is sharing in a, in a robust and proactive way best practices, trying to set high standards for both governance and, and management and the use of best practices. Uh, then to advocate for what the types of successful proven practice programs we're, we're all doing together. And fourthly, and I leave it for fourth, it is to leverage resources that these institutions couldn't raise themselves. And I speak here of a 30 country, $50 million program we did with Nokia over a 12 year program, 12 year uh, time frame, about 50 or 60 countries that we've worked in with Microsoft over 12 years now, a large Caterpillar program now that's, all these are eight figure programs. Yes, part of it is philanthropic at times, part of it is CSR, part of it is their core business, but it's companies wanting to invest in sustainable communities by having, in this case, doing it through the preparation of the next generation of workforce and consumer uh, people, meaning the youth bulge, the largest uh, cohort of teenagers and young adults in the history of the world. We think this is particularly important in middle income countries because quite frankly, if there are two billion people and our next goal, uh, two million people living under, in the poverty, under the, any definition of poverty, and we think we're gonna eradicate poverty, well, I think that half of those live in middle income countries. And as Jerry O'Brien said earlier today, we need differentiated uh, strategies for sure. Too often we have about 200 differentiated strategies because we want to treat each project in each country differently because they're so special and so different. What we try to do is try to find best practices that are transferable. And the Latinos call it, because there's a whole American uh, group that have poo-pooed replication for years and there's a lot written on it and can fill a library. But the Latinos will talk about re-editing. You re-edit a book by updating its graphs and, its and adding a chapter and changing the pictures and translating it to another language and putting an afterword or a foreword or whatever else. Good practices need to be re-edited like that so they can be taken to another part of the world. And I think there, there, there may be a billion people in Paul Collier's bottom billion, uh, but those are countries that are gonna need very different strategies. The middle income countries who probably have more poor people living in than the rest, than, than Collier's. Uh, countries, frankly, have probably a better chance of raising that last segment of poor people in their countries. In all the countries we were talking about today, and even little Costa Rica has some of its poor people too, but the Brazils, the Chinas, the Indias, that's where the bulk of poor people live, and they probably have a chance if we can work with them around these issues. So our DNA across this network is to build public-private partnerships at the national level, because global partnerships are terrific. What UNIDO is doing, and some of our partnerships, you could be, call them global, but really where they're working is at that local level. And oftentimes local is not with the federal government in a Brazil or a Mexico. It's with mayors, it's with regional governments, it's with governors, where frankly, more work gets done and you can see more outcomes. And then you build public-private partnerships with local businesses, not just the, the big global names. Um, we talk a lot at IYF about effectiveness, scale, and sustainability. And that's nothing we invented, but it's something that tries to govern what we do across this network. And that is that you need to invest in things that have real proof and, and, and metrics behind them. So we're all for measurement these days, not just because it's politically correct, because it helps us make our job, do our jobs better. So transparency and accountability are part of it, but frankly, the most important part for me is that we need to measure so we can invest in the right things, the best things, and there's not one best practice, but there are dozens of better practices. And for too long, I think most of us have been investing in well-intentioned practices that don't, no one really knows whether they're, they're proving uh, right or wrong. Um, 
scale then is hugely important in whatever field of development, but particularly for us who have talked about the youth bulge, this, this demographic cohort, if it's to become a dividend rather than a liability, then we have to get to scale for Pete's sake. And frankly, sustainability is the other side of the coin to me, to scale. If you can get it to scale, you'd better figure out how to sustain it. And sustaining means the public sector does have to be involved in, to a great extent because governments too often come in, wipe the slates clean. I'm the new minister of this. I'm going to start history over again, put my name on everything. And there's no sustainability of goodwill or practice or, or investments. Uh, and that happens here in, in our country as well as any other country. Uh, we're very happy to have created a partnership with CSIS in the last few months. You'll hear more about it. Uh, in the months to come. What we're doing is trying to create a youth well-being index, which would not be a name and shame index, but it would be an index around which we could look at a country or a part of the country and say, what is making those young people well off or not? And I mean well off by getting through school, being healthy, civically engaged, and, and job ready. Again, if, if a country isn't doing that, and by country I mean now business and civil society, all the donors that are playing in that country for a while, external donors and the, and the government itself, then we need to be looking at that civically engaged, healthy, and employable adult. Uh, we're happy to have influenced over the years the World Bank in its 2007 World Development Report, which I think is still the, the best single document on, on youth development and how you build these partnerships and how you build and look at youth development is not just education or health, but a whole series of things that make it give us that, could give us that kind of adult or citizen we're looking for in society. And we were happy to work with AID last year in the development as a 51-year-old agency, its first ever youth, youth policy paper. Those things are important, I think, for us as knowledge managers to do is to try to influence the bigger boys and girls in how they run their programs and to influence a big bilateral in the World Bank is important. But we also want to influence the multinationals. And it's and not just to get their money, but to work with them at the core of their businesses. So we're working with Walmart and, and, and McDonald's today in training their entry level employees. McDonald's trains, trains 100,000 young Latins every year. They turn over about 100% of those people too. But can they lower that, that, that rate of losing their people? But can they also see those people who come into a first job? And most of us as parents here know that we want our kids to have a first job, but the first job isn't your end job. So is there some chance of moving up and having a career and thinking of future education and growth? Well, that's what we're trying to do in these pre-employment pre training programs with two employers that are, that are huge. That's core to their business. This is not philanthropy. Uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I think that to us, the public-private partnerships are sort of of and by and for the people, but they are of and by and for the locality. That's where I think real pu public-private partnerships, if they can get traction at a community state level in some of these bigger multi, uh, uh, middle income countries, we can really have some, some pro proven practice programs that then can be taken also to scale because we're influencing the policymakers and the business community. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Rada, please share with us about the Clean Cookstoves Alliance, which if I recall has over 700 members of, of various types, public, private, government. So please, yeah, the floor right. is yours, Rada. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Bill. As I was listening to your presentation, I was thinking, I can take, a, take IYF out of a lot of what you've said and just substitute the Global Alliance in there, and it would sort of apply very much in terms of principles and philosophies. And I think we, we certainly learn a lot from organizations like yours who've been at this for, for a little longer than us. Um, I'd like to start just with 30 seconds on what the issue issue is, because not everyone is aware of the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. So the issue here is the problems that come about as a result of cooking over open fires or cooking over rudimentary stoves. And essentially, there are four types of problems. There's a health issue, an environmental issue, women's empowerment issue, um, as well as an actual bottom line, you know, livelihood, uh, economic impact on families as well. Um, so the first issue related to health, just one statistic, and I won't bore you with any more, um, you know, four million deaths a year result from exposure to cook stoves smoke. 
So it's a number that's, that's significant. It's much larger than many other numbers we're familiar with in terms of HIV, TB, et cetera. But it's one that is a, a silent killer, if you will, and one that hasn't gotten the attention. So that's um, a, a significant area and, and reason why we've, we're in, uh, why we've come into being. Environmentally, just one additional statistic here is 24% of the world's black carbon comes from emissions from these cook stoves. So it's a, it's a significant environmental issue as well. When it comes to women's empowerment, you know, it's hard to be able to empower women to have choices uh, and to be able to do other things with their lives if they're spending 8 to 12 hours a day collecting their fuel and cooking um, over inefficient stoves. So if you want to get to women's, uh, you know, really at the issues of women, women's empowerment, being able to address uh, clean cooking and provide clean cooking solutions is a very quick way of, of getting there. And the fourth area is around economic impact on a household. For those households who are not collecting their fuel, collecting wood, they're buying charcoal or kerosene on a spot basis, on a daily basis, because they can't afford in one, in one soup to buy more, more of their fuel. And so that's approximately 30 to 40 percent of their income, because that charcoal or fuel is cooked relatively inefficiently over an open fire today. So that's the issue and that's the problem. So the Global Alliance came into being uh, in 2010. Um, it was launched at the Clinton Global Initiative and um, it, it seeks to take a market based approach to addressing this problem. So we have a very concrete goal. It's 100 million households achieving sort of clean cooking solutions, cleaner fuels, cleaner stoves, more efficient stoves, heat retention devices, everything along that spectrum by the year 2020. So we were conceived of as a market, uh, sort of a public-private partnership. So it's a little bit different perhaps in the sense that in, in many cases, at least other organizations that I've been with, we have sought to attract private sector partners to join our efforts and to meet our mission. This initiative was really born out of a public-private partnership of 19 partners, many UN agencies, many NGOs, and many corporations as well. There are 19 um, that, that sort of gave birth to it, if you will. And now we're sitting, as Dan said, at about 700 or so organizations um, that are partners across academia, uh, business, NGO, governments, etc. So what do we bring to the sector, and why, why is it important to have an, an, an association or a group like the, like the Global Alliance? In the past, the sector, and I'd say even today, because we're slowly sort of chipping away at it, but not quite there yet, the sector was incredibly fragmented. So whether you are in the academic field, and even within academia, if you're working in health, or in population, or you know, women's empowerment, you are sort of disconnected from, from one another, if you will. Um, and even if you look at the business sector, those involved at any stage of the value chain in producing a, a more efficient stove, whether it's the ceramics liner or those you know, at the, the factory level or the distributors, they just didn't know one another and they're operating in isolation, whether in a, in a community, in a country, or throughout the world. So a very fragmented industry, a nascent industry, one that wasn't looked at as a market and driven by donor and aid, um, aid applications in the past really needed a convening body, if you will, to help, uh, to help kind of bring it together and, and to work uh, sort of collectively towards this 100 million goal. So that's one role that we play in terms of really bringing the sector together. The, the other role, which I think is an overarching one, is that everyone had their own strategy and approach in a very small way of addressing this issue. And as a result, I mean, cook stoves are not a new issue in development. It's been around for several decades. As a result, you had small, small projects that may have succeeded, may not, but nothing that addressed this issue at scale. And so for us, bringing the sector together and developing a cohesive strategy for the sector was really critical. And it's one that donors had talked to us about. It's one, importantly, that investors had talked to us about and said, we cannot invest a dime you know, in this sector, given the fragmentation and given that everyone is moving in a completely different direction to achieve these goals. And so given our market-based approach, we absolutely need to drive investors into the sector and to, you know, within a few years, we hope by 2020, sort of, you know, let it function as an efficient market. Um, so today, we use the grant-based funding that we have, and we call it sort of smart grants, to capitalize and leverage capital. That's the only way we use the grant money that we have. So in addition to donors and investors and, and the networks that they bring to the table, we've had, we had players within the sector, everyone from your small artisanal stove producer to some of the larger companies like Philips that are engaged 
in this as a core business, that said, you know, you've got a role to play here in terms of brokering partnerships within the, uh, you know, the actors within the sector to be able to connect them with one another. Philips knows where it's strong. It might not necessarily be the strongest in that last mile distribution or in that after sales service, you know, and you might need to have women's groups trained to be able to sell the Philips stove and to be able to service that Philips stove every couple of years or so. And so brokering those partnerships even within a sector was another important role that was identified and one that we play as well. So these are some of the different ways, so sort of developing the strategy, bringing different networks and ecosystems together. The biggest for us is the investor group and the investor, larger investor and network, all the way from impact investors to sort of commercial traditional um, you know, uh, financial service providers as well. And so those are some of the different kinds of networks that we're bringing to this issue given the market-based approach that we're taking to, to, uh, to address it as well. Now, Dan asked me to talk a little bit about 700 partners. You know, how does this get managed? Uh, you know, and, and how does it kind of layer, if you will? So there are different roles that we as a global alliance play, and we're quite conscious of the fact that we're just a hub, if you will. We, we're, we have no intention, we're about 12 people, we have no intention of growing more than, I don't know, 15 or 16 people or so. So it's really layering and using many of your partners as ambassadors, as sort of um, uh, hubs within specific areas. So we've got a couple of banks that are our leaders in the investment space, and they kind of take on and, and manage that investor network, if you will. We've got a couple of impact investors that manage that space for us. So it's a little bit of distributed authority, you know, and delegation to help govern these different networks and to help drive their engagement within the broader network of, of 700 partners. The other thing is we don't have offices in any of the countries that we work in. And so the idea is we work through our partners and, and, and that is the uh, one element of sustainability here so that it's not that we have an office and we have staff and so while we're there things will go fine and then we're going to pull back. So that that's uh, from the outset that's how we've sort of designed this and the idea of having all these partners is for them to play roles you know, so that they're active contributors within uh, within the sector as well. Um, so, so those are some of the different ways in which we engage. There are obviously online ways of managing knowledge and communities of practice, many of which have been discussed you know, already. And then there are sort of these offline ways of having alliances that are formed you know, in country. And that's really just, if you think about it, it's an industry association. You know, if you had a mature industry, you have an association that is then championing their issue and advocating governments at different levels and others and prioritizing this issue. And so we help facilitate facilitate those again on the ground so it's less of what our staff, if you will, there, but more right from the beginning, the development of these kinds of um, of actors and institutions that will that will take uh, that will service this sector once it becomes a mature sector in each of these countries as well. So I'm happy to answer any other questions. I don't want to take too much time now, but just to give you a sense of how how we work. And and again, we there are 50 countries that we that we work in. Um, you know, we've again sort of focused in on just six or seven of those to prove the concept that a market-based approach can work and twinned other countries with these six or seven so that there can be learnings and we don't have to kind of be in all of them um, at the same time. And there's a responsibility for some of the middle income countries and these focus countries to take on some of the learnings and share that with, uh, with other countries to help catalyze their cook stove markets as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rada. I'm going to ask uh, Kathleen Vicklin to speak about the work that Karana does, which is a consulting firm working with uh, I, around agricultural value chains in Latin America. Thank you for being with us, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, Karana specializes in crafting and managing networks to uh, solve uh, supply chain problems in an inclusive manner, bringing in the last mile small farmer, bringing in women into the value chains, bringing in at-risk youth into uh, employment, and so that is uh, sort of our, our, our core focus. I want to give a couple of examples of um, networks that we're currently operating and the development challenges that we are facing in those networks and the tools that we're using to, to manage knowledge and share information within those two networks. So one uh, program that we're currently operating is in El Salvador. It's called Improving Access to Employment. It's with US USAID funding for four years and we're have about 20 um, partnerships, which are often called alliances in, in the USAID world. Um, and in each one, we're working with an employer and um, a training institute, nonprofit organization 
to uh, prepare youth for work um, because there are jobs in El Salvador, um, but it's not always easy for the youth to get the jobs because they lack experience, they lack the skills, um, and they haven't been properly trained for the existing jobs. So we have a series of 20 partnerships. We've trained 10,000 youth. But more importantly, I loved uh, Barbara's example. We've truly built those 20 alliances so that at the end of the four years, it's not just 10,000 youth, because in El Salvador, there's 100,000 youth every year who are either leaving school, graduating or not, is more, more likely. So we need a transformational solution, and the partnerships can indeed do that. The second example is our Peru Cocoa Alliance, uh, which is a five-year USAID program. It's a, non, uh, uh, a, a GDA, Global Development Alliance, um, working with some of the largest cocoa investors and buyers around the world, working with the research firms that are located in uh, Peru, in the areas where they were formerly growing coca. So we're going from coca, it's been eradicated three times by DeVita, and now the population is uh, very much in need of long-term income solutions, uh, and cocoa can be a part of that. However, uh, cocoa has um, its strongest yield beginning in about year four, and so we also bring in short-term crops such as plantains and chilies to bring in immediate income. And we're doing all of that through alliances, um, through networks. So one of our goals is to shift the paradigm towards the co-creation of value for inclusive economic development. We want to bring the private sector in, we want to bring the government in, find where the supply chain problems are. You need a deep technical understanding. I think one of the key messages that's been coming out of our presentations throughout the morning has been value. A network will be vibrant and dynamic and active and sustainable if it's providing value to its members. And so um, each of our partners has to get value. Why is Armajara our partner? They need fine flavor cocoa. There's political unrest in Africa in the traditional sources of supply. Prices are up. Middle income countries are, are demanding more cocoa. They need uh, sources of supply that are inclusive, that don't involve child labor, that are traceable. So if there's a problem in the supply chain, they know exactly where it is and we can immediately fix it. We can help them do that in the alliance. The, the research uh, um, organizations are critical. We need varieties of cocoa that will provide high yields for the farmers. Again, they're not going to be involved in the alliance unless their income is up. How can their income go up? It's either greater demand, more sales, or higher yield, or some combination of those two. So, um, and then the area cooperatives are key members of the, the networks in, in Peru. And they want to boost yield and income for their members, so the, the, the agricultural cooperatives. A second development goal that we're solving through the networks is um, we need to structure the co-investment. And so the first step in that is a memorandum of understanding, which is where we all sit around the table. And it does begin with face-to-face. -face. That's another common theme from throughout the morning, is these, these are relationships. And they can begin face to face, and then we can use our technological tools to continue to provide value and share documents, and, and, and the, the relationships can grow, but we need to begin face to face. And so the memorandum of understanding, we all sit down and we say, here's my goal, here's what I can contribute, here's, my, here's what I need to, uh, to get out of it. And they need to be very specific, they need to be written. They need to be detailed and they need to be monitored. Then you take the memorandum of understanding and you implement it through a, a very, uh, either a sub-award, which is either a subcontract or a grant agreement, which again is very specific. So with our training institutes, we clarify, you're providing the training, you're providing the, the classroom, you're providing the trainer. USAID can often fi uh, finance developing the curricula in, in keeping with uh, employer needs. Um, so everyone plays their role, everyone's clear, down to who's providing snack, which sounds small, but you know, when we're training these at-risk youth, we need to have a nice lunch for them every day. And so that can be an opportunity for a small business to get involved and provide lunch, and that needs to be within the overall context of the, of the network, who's providing those services. A, second, a third key development challenge is we need to share a lot of information to make this work. And we're using both cloud-based and server-based solutions, such as Dropbox, such as um, online monitoring and evaluation systems and geo-referenced uh, traceability systems 
so that we know exactly which farmer is treating which crops, how, and we can trace that all the way to the final buyer. A really exciting um, network in the Peru Cocoa Alliance is our Germplasm Advisory Committee. And that means what type of cocoa are we going to plant? And that needs to be decided between the private sector who knows what they want to buy because they know what the consumer wants, between the, the science and technology community who's been developing varieties that can boost farmer income, and between the producer associations who know the level of risk that their farmers are willing to take. And so often, without a convener, a broker was the word Radha used, and that's such an important role. We have to be the broker and bring everyone together to make that decision. So last month, we, brought, we sat down with Armajaro and with the International uh, Tropical Crop Institute and the universities and the producer associations. And we got together in a room face to face and we said, where's the best yield for the fine flavor cocoa that's going to give us the best chocolate that'll sell well and increase income for the small farmers in the former coca growing areas? And we chose six. And that is a fundamental departure from the way those decisions used to be made. And it's, and it's sustainable, and it's market-based. So we're just thrilled. Um, finally, there's a really important role for bringing new partners into these networks. New local partners, small NGOs, small universities, who for one reason or another, may not be traditional partners for, for USAID assistance. Um, and so local capacity building is an important role. And we're, we're not doing anything. Um, the tools we're using are, you know, it's mentoring, it's training, it's technical assistance to help additional NGOs to be ready to join these networks and receive USAID funding and, um, and provide value to their clients. So again, I, I come back to that core principle, which is uh, providing value. Um, and I think our overall, the, the guiding principle is that relationships that are properly supported with consensus building and information sharing mechanisms power growth. And it's just an exciting time to be part of this new way of doing business. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I'm going to ask some questions, and then I'm going to ask my colleague Michael Levitt, who's a senior associate here at CSIS, who used to be the president and CEO of CDC Development Solutions, but also was the founding president of Business for Social Responsibility, and was the author of a very interesting report that we did here at CSIS around value chains to provide a response to the conversation we've just been having. But first, I want to take a couple of questions from the audience. So if people have questions or comments from the audience, now would be the moment for those. Yes, please. It's a woman here in the second row. We'll get you a microphone. I'm Margaret Daly Hayes, and um, a, uh, I'm focusing right now on security sector issues, but I've covered Latin America from just about every perspective. Um, I am curious, and Bill, it was your presentation that prompted this, but I think several of you have uh, a contribution, and that is how um, are these groups sharing information? Um, how it, does it require face-to-face -face, uh, using technology, um, especially in your youth uh, experience? But I think there are many others. Bill? Well, I think we do share. <laughs> do share of, of, of sharing. Some of it is in conferencing bringing people together and, and showing off in public that you've got maybe two or three international donors from the multilateral and bilateral community, not just one. And you've got not just one or two companies that want all the branding and excitement themselves, but maybe a whole bunch. And that some of them are big name international types and some of them are local folks. And then the CSO, so they can get to know each other and share and have the government people who are a part of it with them. Um, Clearly, though, in today's world, once they go home, 
they can stay connected in so many different ways that back when you and I were starting our careers, you couldn't even think of, of, of connecting a, a local NGO with its own government halfway across from Bahia to, to Brasilia or something like that, uh, let alone to another country. Uh, then it's, it's, it's publishing in different ways and using social media to, to push it out, the results of your, of your measurements and, and all. So the, and, and we do, and I think several of these folks do, uh, an online system of, of inputting that information too, so that a little NGO is not sending ridiculous reports or maybe they even faxing them as they did 10 years ago, but uploading the information right there. And then they're part of it and they can access it too. So they can feel that they're part of something bigger. And I think that's, that's very important. But is that information available within the network we, we make it, it, frankly, it's open to anyone who wants to see it. We, we want actually to see a, a much broader dissemination beyond just the sharing of within our, our alliance. Rada, do you have, do you have any comments on that? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of communities of practice and portals are increasingly important, both to build cohesiveness, you know, within the networks, as well as to share, you know, with others. So we have sort of a membership-based portal where if you're just working on, you know, it's work in progress, you don't necessarily want that shared and you want to just bounce off ideas, etc. And so we have these portals, which I'm sure, you know, others do as well, sort of more functionally based. So if you're a tester sitting in, you you know, in Senegal and you want to understand how to better use a particular protocol in testing a cook stove and you want to connect that, you know, and, and get some thoughts and ideas from our Chinese colleagues and our, you know, Bolivian colleagues, etc. So that may not necessarily be open, you know, to everybody, but it's a way of sharing that information very quickly. And increasingly, you know, the point about people, you know, in a network need to see value. If they see sort of quick responses and people are using these, it's amazing the amount of traffic, you know, that's actually in, in these online ways of sharing. Yeah, Kathy, how do you get farmers to change behaviors from one farm to another? On well, That's one question. But then how do you take your learning of what you're doing in agriculture in Latin America and how do you crosswalk it to Africa? Um, Farmers will change their behavior much like, uh, much like any of us will when they see evidence that there is a benefit to doing so. And so one of our most powerful uh, tools is demonstration farms. And so that's, we've taken those six clonal varieties that we've identified will be the new markets in Peru and we are developing demonstration farms to show farmers how to grow it and, um, and what to grow. And that's one of the most powerful mechanisms. Uh, we transfer information across countries um, using a couple of ways. One is through our partners. So we work with McElhaney, does Tabasco sauce, and we're, we, I don't know where we started working with them, but now we're in, um, we're in Africa with them, we're in Nicaragua with them, we're in Ecuador with them, and, and they're helping us to increase uh, income for the, in Peru as well. Um, so we, once you have the trust, which is an issue that's come up a number of times, you've got the relationship and we can say to them, you know, we've been working so well together in Nicaragua, we've got another opportunity. And we can get you good quality chilies um, at a good price uh, in a traceable value chain. Are you interested? And, and because you've proven that you provide value, they, they often say yes. So um, you can take that network and just apply it to a new country. Um, we have weekly management meetings at which we share what's going well, what's not going well with our projects and, and help, help one another solve problems. Um, we're a matrixed organization, so we also have um, technical working groups that meet uh, as needed, sharing documents and, and um, best practices and lessons learned. In terms of an, another very powerful information sharing tool, particularly for youth-based programs, is Facebook. And in El Salvador, we have 50,000 Facebook fans who every week trade 300,000 tips on where's their jobs, where's their good training, uh, how do you dress for an interview, how'd you get that job, um, and that's more than any radio station in Salvador can reach. And so we have developed a peer network that's sustainable. Now it takes two hours a day to monitor that traffic and provide that mm -hmm. feedback and that value. So it's not free, but phenomenally powerful. And go where your audience is. They're already on Facebook. Don't, don't create another network. Although we, do, we also use our website, you know, post all of our... Uh, manuals for vocational training and uh, all of those. Okay, uh, my colleague from Costa Rica had a comment. Rachel. If you... Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make uh, concrete questions and in this environment sometimes a bit awkward, but uh, to Rada. Um, 
have you fami are you familiar with Energy for All uh, initiative and have you been in contact or have you somehow exchanged information? But because I think the two things are very closely related. That's, that's one question. The other question is, uh, you mentioned Philips, but it could be another uh, multinational uh, corporation. How do you make sure, or how do you handle the fact that um, these partnerships or alliances uh, or networks uh, don't uh, play the role, let's say, for them to get information from the other small producers, and maybe they will enter a new market and will destroy the, the, the market for the small producers. I mean, it doesn't happen the other way around. It's almost impossible for small producers to compete, let's say, with a, with a big multinational, but it can happen that way. And for Kathleen, um, just uh, uh, as a word of caution or something, when you enter into that, being the broker and all of that, it's a, a great example, but you acquire some responsibilities because I know examples of in Costa Rica, especially in the agricultural sectors, that the buyers, let's say, say, okay, this and this and this, but then they incentivize volumes of production that later they won't buy. So they are able to get the prices lower uh, and buy to a lower price. Uh, and there are all kinds of risks involved. So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a risky thing. I don't know if I made myself clear, but uh, uh, you know, they. They, they tell you what is the kind of, uh, I'm not presenting here, you know, that the multinationals are all bad or whatever, but they, those are risks that are involved. And when you enter into that uh, role, then you, 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 you have um, some responsibilities in that sense. Uh, maybe the production will be much larger. Uh, the farmers won't be able to sell all what they produced and because they are agricultural products, they will go rotten or whatever, or the price will be low, things like that. Thank okay. You. Okay. Great. Now, thank you for those two questions. Um, yes, we are familiar with Energy for All in, in uh, ADB runs that in Asia, Sustainable Energy for All, which we've heard about, which is a, a great welcome addition. And the World Bank has three cooking programs as well in different parts of the world. So a big part of what we did at the very beginning in determining the sector strategy is also to say who's doing what so that we have a clear understanding of both shaping all of those and then deciding what our role is. I mean, I think it's the beauty of coming in late, you know, and, and being able to say, let's see what there is what's worked, what hasn't, who are the actors. And, and so far, given that we've developed the sector strategy cohesively, we've actually been able to then say, all right, who now takes on different roles here in achieving this? So actually, it's very nice to, to see that we're all working um, relatively well together. So, um, so I think that that's a good part. Your second question around multinationals and their role. You know, it's an interesting sector to be in because it's not immediately very attractive to very large multinationals for a couple of reasons. Um, a cook stove is not a light bulb. It's not not a commodity product today that can be used equally well you know, across every part of the world. Today, when you're looking at the base of the pyramid, those who are cooking at the base of the pyramid have very different types of needs in different parts of the world. So that's one reason it's not immediately attractive for a big multinational, because they can't just come in with you know, one product or a var variation of those products and say it can be applied to all of these markets, you know, 500 million households worldwide. So that, that's one issue. The second issue is reach into these smaller communities. So yes, a big chunk of our 500 million households who need clean cooking solutions are in urban and peri-urban areas, but close to 50% or more are in rural areas. And these large companies today still, some do, but many do not have those networks um, to, to, have that, to have that reach. So we see actually what's occurring is a very nice uh, necessary partnership between MNCs and SMEs, you know, to be able to have that full and efficient um, value chain from end to end. The, the third issue I would say is is service. So a cook stove, while somewhat simple, you know, relative to some of our stoves, if you will, that we're used to, still has several moving pieces within it, pieces that do need to be serviced, need to be replaced, etc. And it's going to be a while before you have a large company that has an office, you know, in some of these villages and communities that's able to do that. So again, a fairly nice and, and necessary partnership between some of the smaller artisanal players and the larger ones. Um, and in the sector, I will go so far as to say there are many smaller producers who are coming to realize that they cannot design the stove, manufacture the stove, distribute the stove, and do after-sales service. They actually would welcome some of these larger players to both
both define the product category so people know what the hell cook stoves are and sort of, you know, and why is this important, you know, to be able to use that. And, that, and for that, actually, many of them do welcome the Philips and others of, of the world as well. Barbara, you Thanks. I, I just wanted to add to what uh, Rada was just saying uh, and, and trying to um, hope, hopefully answer your question. I think uh, looking at it from a value chain perspective, um, we, we very much work with multinationals uh, when it comes to um, developing the capacity of second, third, and fourth tier suppliers. Uh, because usually the large companies have development programs for the first tier suppliers, but then when it trickles down further to the ground, then there is no capacity. Uh, and they, as, as Rana rightly said, they often simply lack, lack the knowledge on how to bring these suppliers into the supply chain and actually make sure that they deliver the right product at the right time, at the right quality. And I think this is very much where we complement each other. Obviously, when we sign partnerships with, uh, with companies, we make it very clear that this is not an exclusive partnership and that our development uh, supplier programs are very much open to also um, um, uh, cooperate with other uh, larger companies that could very well be competitors of the partners that uh, that we work with. But I think looking at it from a supply chain angle, this is very much where a lot of um, cooperation can take place. Other, other comments? Uh, just to respond to your question, um, it's something we take very much to heart. Business is business. And they're there to buy good product at the best price they can. Uh, so we've taken two steps to provide uh, our farmers with as many options as possible. After all, we see one of our key roles is providing with information on options and the capacity to respond to that information, the financing and the, the right variety seeds and the good agricultural practices. So we're using an integrated agroforestry model, which includes plantain, provides shade for the cocoa, also provides food for the family, and they can sell it for, to Frito-Lay and make chips. In addition, there's the chilies. And those are both short cycle crops, so that's immediate income. And then you've got the cocoa. And then long term, you, we've also got um, uh, timber or, and or carbon credits by keeping the forestry, the forests. So we want to provide the farmers with options. Um, we also, I mentioned Armajaro by name, but we have multiple buyers. We're not certainly working with just one buyer. So the farmers can sell to Romex or you know, any, anyone that they want. It's, it's an open, open arrangement. Okay, I'm, this time I'm going to ask uh, my friend Michael Levitt, uh, who's with us here at CSIS, to provide a response to w this, this discussion that we've been having about value chains and, and partnerships. Michael, I'm going to ask you if you would to, to speak from the dais, if you would. Um, normally I would thank you, Dan, but I'm not sure I appreciate this opportunity because usually when you're asked to do this, it's to fill in blanks in presentations. And I thought these were all fabulous presentations in which at least I was inspired, and I don't say that very often, but you really did identify the commonalities, the difficulties. I mean, it was, it was extremely helpful to me. So let me just throw in that the one piece that was throughout which is the private that there's a private sector piece in all of this um, and just for some of you younger in here this conversation would not have happened 10 years ago five years ago I don't know how few years ago the fact that the government or NGO world would be sitting here saying, we're going to figure out what the core business is, the core need of a business, and work to that. Um, the organization that Dan mentioned that I ran for a number of years, a few years ago decided to move away from going after AID funding because we were doing a lot of training programs around SMEs. And we felt that AID funding was not tied to the end user. Who, what were we training people for? We knew we were supposed to go find out who was going to hire people in the long run and work back from that. That's very different. And this whole conversation was very different from, from that. 
But, and I think it's also really important to recognize that the private sector is motivated in a very different way than it used to be. Um, as Dan said, I was the founding president of Business for Social Responsibility. 20 years ago when we started the corporate social responsibility movement, most companies said we were, if not nuts, probably doing something illegal because we were saying co corporate money should be spent in a different way. Now, everybody has a CSR department, and in fact, I would say one of the things you said was, we've got to go beyond CSR. We want to get down to fundamental business. Because as we found working with the corporate social responsibility departments, is usually those programs are short in duration. And let me put this the nicest way, you know, this year they're funding a great agriculture program and next year the new CEO is really much more interested in the ballet in San Francisco and that's where CSR money goes. I used to say the wife of the CEO was interested in the ballet. Now, so the, the CEO is interested in the ballet and that's where the money's going to go. You want operations money, you want marketing money, and you all know that now. Um, now, I do want to ask, what happens when your corporate partner who is doing wonderful things in the environment does terrible things to their employees in Bangladesh? What do you do? Do you walk out on the partnership? Do you fire them? Uh, that's a serious question. Um, because you can be a wonderful company on the HR side and a less than wonderful company intentionally or unintentionally environmentally. And how, we d how you come to deal with these things in these partnerships and networks I think is going to be a very important, a very important thing. Also, it seemed to me that in each one of these there was the continuing need for donor money. Somewhere in each one of these there's not enough to be sustainable, and the, I'm, as a private sector guy, what I mean by sustainable is profitable, so I'm paying my own way. And I think in each one of yours, you need a, you, you need at least a moment in time in which there's good guy money somewhere in the piece. And I don't know, is that, is that a true fact? And if so, can we look forward to a time when that's not true in each one of yours, when, when the system itself is, is self-sustaining. I was going to say, the, one of the big changes for me in, in the motivation of, of business um, is the fact that for most of the major companies now, the countries we used to see as sources of cheap labor or cheap natural resources are now markets or future markets. So that a company that used to care about buying bananas in a, company, in a country now needs to worry about selling bananas in that country. And so that, country, that company is concerned about the economic health, the economic well-being of the people of that country because they wanted to buy the bananas. And I think if the more that motivation changes, the easier life is going to be. But let me, let me, have you had to deal with, if I can ask Please, a question. that's a good question. Have you had to deal with one of your partners going bad? Right, did, getting a, did you have to ever get a divorce? Right? <laughs> well, if I yes, have by the way. Sure. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think these are very pertinent questions as you raised. And in fact, uh, to respond to your first one, um, first of all, before we engage in a partnership, we do a very thorough due diligence. So we make sure that we know who we are getting yeah, to, uh, to, um, to a marriage with. Having said that, obviously that still entails the risk that while we are partnering with them that something can go wrong in that company. And also one thing is clear, I think there is not a single multinational company on this planet that doesn't have some wrongdoing somewhere uh, in the world. The question is also, and that is a question we very much uh, argue and debate with within UNIDO is, should we only work with the good guys? Because part of the reason we might be partnering with them is trying to bring them actually to slowly change their behavior and make sure that uh, they are more uh, open to a more responsible way of doing business. So I think uh, all of this together, yes, I mean, we, we monitor very carefully 
uh, who we partner with. And we always also have an exit strategy that is also part of the, the MOU that we usually sign with them. And uh, there, there, there can be cases where, where this is very much uh, becoming an issue because we simply feel that this is not uh, a partner that is fit to the standards that we want to work with. Bill, I'm sure you yeah, let me just ask each of the panelists to take this. Bill. Well, I, I think it's a very good one. Uh, we don't stop working with the U.S. government just because in the last week or so uh, there have been two scandals, too, that might parallel what Walmart Thank you. was doing Exa in, in Mexico. Point, point well taken. Uh, point well taken. I'll, I'll, I'll look at it this way. When we worked with Gap and the Nike and Nike about 12, 13 years ago, when their, their images were horrible about running, of course, their images were horrible because they were the biggest, and usually the, the folks who go after uh, the, the watchdogs and all who go after it. You don't go after the little guy, you go after the really big big one. But when they said they wanted to do something to, yes, improve their, their brand and their image, but also to improve their, 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 their workplaces, and really what that meant was their supply chains in, in Asia, we said, fine, but it has to be a multi-year investment. It has to be a large investment. It can't be just a little cute thing that you're then going to spend $100,000 on it and then $500,000 extolling the nice work you did. It ha this has to be a, a serious investment. It also had to be a serious, and all the money had to be up front. And all the money then would be managed by a type of governing structure that had the companies involved, but had some outsiders involved, in, including a managing director of the World Bank uh, as part of it. Uh, and then what would happen if shit happens? Because it will. I mean, That's a technical term we use at the think tank. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, some of the worst fires in garment right. ma manufacturing. As a result of, as a result of cook stoves, <laughs> yeah. as Michael was just. <laughs> you know, no one's talking about the fires in New York about 100 years ago that killed a couple hundred women uh, who were working in, in similar situations. Yeah. It's what do you do afterwards? So we put in place if something happens, how are you going to talk about it, reveal it, discuss it? And then that sort of thing. And then I will just raise one other thing. We worked with two very big companies that didn't go out of business or didn't, didn't go bad because they did horrible things. They just stopped running their company well. We worked for collectively about 20 years in about 40 different countries with over about $70 million worth of investments with Nokia and Lucent. If you haven't checked your stock <laughs> portfolios, most of you don't have them. Or if you do, you're selling them to to offset some of your gains somewhere else. It's companies don't make money necessarily forever. And some of the worst things that can happen to them is if they go down. Anyway. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Great. Did so on, on clean cook stoves and, yeah, and things that happen. <laughs> I think there are a couple of things that are important just to, to add on to what's been said, because we agree with all of that. I think it's just alignment of vision and philosophy when you're working with, with any partner, but, but definitely from a, a corporate partner perspective as well. Sort of those principles, what are they aiming to get out of it? What are we aiming to get out of it? And most of our, our corporate partnerships are the ones that take the longest to develop. It's actually much shorter to have a bilateral relationship and a relationship with the foundation. The corporate ones that are, I think what we've all talked about, multifaceted, multi-year, large ones to have impact, those could take 18 to 24 months, you know, really at, at the minimum to even really come about in a robust fashion. And a good part of that is, yes, the due diligence, but also, as I'm sure we've all seen, you know, that, that relationship development and, and those core principles that are going to guide this in, in addition to sort of exit strategies and what do we do when things go wrong. So I think that that's, that's very important. Um, I do want to touch on the issue of, you know, businesses can be run poorly or, you know, things happen in the, in the, in the global world that have negative impacts, and suddenly a terrific partner who continues to have a stellar reputation just can't meet their commitment with you, you know, and, and you may have sort of counted on a five-year, seven-year, multi-million dollar relationship, but their business has just taken a turn, and, you know, year three, they can't continue to do that. And so for us, that's been something real that we've had to deal with as well, and how do you, when you're balancing your portfolio every year of the interventions that are necessary and what you need to do, how do you think carefully about, you know, and, and attach some weight and some risks to these so that you still balance kind of some of the traditional donor input, the in, you know, investment resources, as well as some of these corporate resources as well. Okay. Kathy? On sustainability, I'll give uh, three examples. So for the training courses, um, if they're good training courses, 
uh, and they are preparing the youth to get jobs, um, then someone's going to want to continue to offer them because they'll be able to charge for it. And so, for example, our tourism, our English for Work for Tourism has been picked up by the Salvadoran Tourism Association. And they, and between them and the students, they're going to continue to offer that course. The most of our courses have been picked up by INSAFORP, which is the governmental entity that receives a 1% payroll tax in El Salvador. They don't do the training. They then contract out the training, but they pay for it And betwe between INSAFORP and the, the trainee. Most of our courses are picked up by then. So it's off-ramped into, and it'll be offered as long as it's agile. And Casa Tour and INSAFORP have worked with the business to create that curriculum so that they can keep it agile because our jobs change, their jobs change, and the competencies to fill that job will change, and they need to keep that curricula um, up to date. For the Peru Cocoa Alliance, we are creating a local NGO that is the Peru Cocoa Alliance. We are financing it through a 4% fee on um, uh, financing that's provided to the small farmers. So that money is going in and we'll, we'll fund the Peru Cocoa Alliance. So there's an enormous amount of subsidy and investment in bringing together the alliance. But once you've got the relationships and you've got the trust, it's a lower cost mechanism to continue it. It's still, there's still a role to manage this alliance, but it can be funded. And, but you need to develop that funding mechanism early on. Thanks very much. I'm going to just uh, I want to thank the panel. I also want to thank my friend Michael Levitt. I want to give him a chance to do a public service announcement. I had mentioned the report that we had done, uh, that he had done uh, here at CSIS on supply chains. I just would like you just to just to, just reference it if you would, Michael. Yes, just very quickly. There are copies outside, and what made me think of it is this is the uh, Cocoa Alliance in Ecuador that we used as a a role model, a case study, because we wanted to show the incredible power of supply chain in economic development around SMEs and that most of the work that had been done before looked at a sector, usually oil and gas. And this tried to cross cut oil and gas, tourism, ag, whatever it was. I have one little question. Can I, I'll be quick. You, you described the Cook Alliance. It was different in part because it started as an alliance, I mean, more than anything else. But it also had a, here's the solution, I mean, in the sense of a better cook stove. Has that been replicated? Have you identified the 16 things that makes the Cook Stove Alliance different and said, what else is, could we use that model on elsewhere? Is somebody else... We looking have a lot for of questions replication. about that, so we are sort of trying to, to document some of that. It might be something that we're happy to work with CSIS on. So we'll Good. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, folks.